Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to call to order the 12 p.m. special PSVS meeting of April 21st, 2022. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz? Here. Vice Chair Abernathy? <clears throat> Here. Committee Member Madeline? Here. Committee Member Dewey? Committee Member Prez Andreessen? Here. Committee Member Keller? Committee Member Komen? Here. Committee Member Singh? Here. And Committee Member Prince? Here. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Adoption of minutes for the April 14th, 2022. Excuse me. Uh, meeting. Public comments? Are there any public comments? Apologize. Public comments. All right. Statements for items listed on today's agenda are given a two minute time limit, 20 minutes total per agenda item. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give them to the clerk who will give copies to the committee. If you're here to make a public statement, please fill out a public speaker card and hand it to the city clerk. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers? No public comment cards have been received. All right, next item, please. Item 3A, adoption of minutes for the April 14th, 2022 meeting. All right. Minutes from the last meeting were distributed to the committee. Um, do I have a motion to approve or any amendments? I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of April 14th. Right. I'll second. A uh, motion by committee member Komen and second by committee member Perez Andreessen. Madam Clerk, if you'll please call the roll. Chair Ortiz? Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy? Aye. Committee Member Madeline? Aye. Committee Member Dewey is absent. Committee Member Perez Andreessen? Aye. Committee Member Keller is absent. Committee Member Komen? Aye. Committee Member Singh? Aye. Committee Member Prince? Aye. Motion is approved with Committee Members Dewey and Keller absent. Great. Next item, please. New business item 4A, fiscal year 2022-23 PSVS proposed budget <clears throat> overview. All right. Thank you. I will turn to the city manager to continue our presentations. Thank you, Chair Ortiz. Just a couple quick comments and we'll kick off um, right into homelessness where we left off at our last meeting. Um, we did extend our time today, but I do think we'll be able to be efficient with our time uh, uh, in review of the presentations. Uh, I would also suggest that uh, both um, the historic spending as well as the proposed spending is emphasized in public safety and homelessness, and so there's more time spent in those areas, whereas um, uh, fiscal solvency will be very brief as well as our quality of life and infrastructure, we do have you know meaningful projects there and we'll walk through each of those, but it was intentional. We spent more time on public safety. We'll do so also with homelessness and then we'll move pretty quickly in the other areas. And then as we wrap up, we will uh, have summary slides again of all the proposed items uh, for the committee to be able to um, make motions and take action on. So with that, we will turn time over to Paul Saldana to talk about um, oh, oh, just really briefly about economic development in context and then hit homelessness for us. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Paul Saldana, Director of Economic and Community Development. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, one of the uh, several areas that we handle um, in the Economic and Community Development Department. But just for uh, purposes of an of overview, uh, the department handles a number of different uh, priority initiatives and coordinates a variety of federal, state, and local uh, funding programs. And these are the areas that we cover, uh, neighborhood vitality, economic opportunity, business success, uh, tourism and marketing, and then the two areas that we'll talk about this afternoon, affordable housing and uh, homeless services. So uh, the city has a uh, sort of a four-point uh, homelessness response uh, program uh, that we 
uh, that we really um, have a variety of our investments uh, within. Uh, quality of life uh, includes the rapid response teams, uh, clean cities initiatives, and biohazard uh, cleanup. Uh, you'll hear from my uh, colleague Chris Boyle about those programs and how they address those quality of uh, life uh, issues. Under that includes our impact teams, uh, which you heard from our police chief last week. Uh, those are all included in that quality of life uh, response area. Uh, for homeless uh, prevention, uh, the, these are uh, areas where we work uh, to assist residents who are at risk of becoming homeless, and uh, we do that through the distribution of federal and state funding through uh, rapid rehousing and rental assistance programs. Uh, those um, <clears throat> programs currently, we're managing about $45 million in those prevention activities. The other two areas are homeless services and affordable housing, and these are the areas that I'm going to primarily focus on uh, in this uh, presentation. So on the homeless services side, uh, this table uh, that you have in your, your handouts as well shows the various programs uh, that our department manages uh, in conjunction with the, uh, with the city manager's office as well. Uh, our homelessness staff uh, includes four professional planners who currently manage several dozen contracts. Uh, with different service providers in the community, including Flood Ministries, the Community Action Partnership, uh, Mission at Kern County, uh, Bakersfield Homeless Center, uh, Alliance Against uh, Family Violence, Mercy House, the Superintendent of Schools, and a number of other uh, organizations. The outreach services provided by Flood Ministries averages about 76 contacts um, per week, they, and they continue to be a source of referral for our local programs. Our partnership with the uh, Bakersfield Homeless, uh, Homeless Center employs 106 uh, homeless individuals, and this is a, a city-funded uh, job uh, center that we uh, completed actually in this past December. The work in this area is very collaborative, and uh, it's implemented in a coordinated fashion with all of these agencies and a number of others that I, uh, that I didn't uh, mention. <clears throat> So the city leverages and uses PSVS dollars to leverage a number of different uh, programs. And as you can see here, this is our current 2021-22 uh, 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 spending of a total of $13 million, uh, that uh, $3.6 million in, in local PSVS uh, investment uh, really does uh, leverage the, the federal and the state uh, funding that we have. And this, again, uh, just you know, represents the partnership uh, and the total amount that we're uh, really investing to address the issues here. Uh, as you probably uh, saw, Mayor Go held a press conference yesterday to really stress the importance of the continued investment by the state uh, to help us to leverage and address the issues both locally and at a regional uh, basis. Most of the PSVS funding um, that we uh, invest is in the operation of the uh, Brundage Lane Navigation Center, or BLNC. And the uh, uh, BLNC is, uh, represents two of the three requests that we have uh, this, for this coming fiscal year. We opened BLNC in October of 2020 with 150 beds. This was part of the city's overall uh, support of 400 new shelter beds in the city of Bakersfield between 20 and uh, 21. Um, I'll share a, a few statistics, uh, and, and my uh, co uh, colleague Anthony Valdez is here from the city manager's office also uh, to, uh, uh, to expand on any questions related to the operations, um, but we really have had a, a number of successes with, uh, with BLNC. Our one-time requests um, in that area uh, include $60,000 to repair the roof. Uh, at BLNC, we did not include that uh, allocation in our uh, expansion uh, request, uh, and so this is an area where uh, we 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 feel the need that we uh, to improve that. Uh, the city council recently um, uh, um, approved a uh, ad hoc committee led by uh, Vice Mayor Weir and Council Members Gray and Arias, who have really taken a 
uh, a deeper look at some of the issues related to mental health and substance abuse and public safety. And the city's also been engaged with the district attorney and local law enforcement on how do we remove some barriers from individuals experiencing homelessness and allow them to attain jobs and in some cases housing as well. And so one of those areas that we've talked about uh, with the district attorney has been the uh, housing, the, the homeless courts. And so our proposal is to set aside uh, $500,000 in PSVS dollars to uh, look at and continue to look at ways on how we could uh, partner with the district attorney in um, addressing some of those uh, some of those issues. I mentioned the uh, the BLNC, and that's been part of this 400 bed uh, shelter expansion uh, throughout the city. Uh, we are at 98% capacity on average, and that has been the driver for the council approving uh, the expansion of the facility by 119 beds. Our outreach teams report that an average of 74 individuals are turned away uh, on a regular basis because of the lack of capacity. Uh, the work uh, the, of Mercy House, who's our contracted uh, operator of BLNC, has been uh, incredible. As I mentioned, they've been able to place 126 individuals in permanent uh, housing. Uh, we have a number of individuals that uh, currently have vouchers for permanent housing, uh, and once those become available, we'll be able to uh, place those and release those uh, beds for other, uh, other guests at the facility. <clears throat> Uh, as part of that expansion uh, that the City Council approved, we will, uh, and once it's completed this fall, we will need funding to uh, handle the operational costs uh, and the case management costs of those guests that are coming in. And so the uh, one time, or sorry, the ongoing uh, budget request is for 1.8 million, uh, and that would be the, uh, uh, the remainder of the operational costs for that expansion uh, in fiscal 2022-23. And then moving on to uh, affordable housing, I just wanted to uh, sort of uh, complete the, um, uh, uh, the overview of the homeless services um, uh, response from the city. We've been uh, engaged in a number of different projects uh, over the last several years. In fact, since 2018, when we started to uh, ramp up on some of the investments in affordable housing, we've been able to uh, either finance or secure and support the financing and funding of the development of 509 uh, affordable housing units uh, throughout the city. Uh, this is an area that we've been able to leverage uh, $3 million in uh, PSVS uh, funding or $9 million over the last several years. And that has been leveraged to attain $82 million in development financing and investments in these projects. This kind of gives you a summary of the projects that we have uh, currently uh, either in, in uh, completed or in the pre-development uh, phase. We've done a number of infill housing projects in partnership with the Housing Authority of Kern County. Uh, the Decatur Hotel just broke, uh, we just did a ribbon cutting for that uh, not too long ago. Those are 27 units that are uh, dedicated to seniors in, here in the downtown uh, area. Uh, Sagewood Apartments, uh, I, last week when I was prepared, I was going to say yesterday uh, they closed escrow on that project. Now it's a week ago. Uh, but they will be building 72 units. Um, and then the 6th Street Apartments uh, project is actually under construction now. We've got two other uh, fairly sizable projects uh, that are uh, that are going to be, uh, they're, they're in the pre-development uh, stages, the Renaissance at Baker with 85 units, and then the Madison Place um, uh, renovation uh, project, which is 80 additional units. So you can see that the, the investments that we've been doing on an ongoing basis uh, on the affordable housing side with PSVS funding has made a, a, um, a huge difference in just a short uh, period of time. <clears throat> As, um, as you can see, we've, we've really made uh, a considerable investment and a considerable, uh, some considerable work has been done in both of these uh, areas. We've um, really taken from a staff level a solutions-oriented uh, co collective approach to, um, uh, to addressing this. The uh, uh, advocacy and leadership that the mayor has taken on a statewide level has assisted us in um, keeping this at the forefront of um, 
of our um, of the folks in Sacramento, and then our um, our vice mayor and the council members through the ad hoc committee have really worked to uh, look at opportunities for how we can collaborate at the local level uh, to address some of the uh, other challenges and issues beyond just uh, the affordable housing and and the and the temporary sheltering. Uh, of individuals. So uh, we, we again have, um, and to use this uh, or to paraphrase from this quote, our, our approach really is to rise to that next level uh, and create solutions that are both measure, measurable and transformative for our community. Uh, so with that, I would be happy to answer your questions. Um, Any questions on Mr. Saldana's? I would just say on homeless courts, I know that um, the mayor and I attended a conference in San, in San Diego um, about three years ago now, and we saw the San Diego's homeless courts and how much they've been able to impact that issue. And so I'm really excited about the prospect of bringing that to Kern County and the partnership with the district attorney. I think that's a, a great program. Vice Chair Abernathy, did you have questions? All right, um, a couple. When I look at what I see, you know, homeless parked on benches and medians and on California and in alleys and everywhere, I, I don't believe they end up in affordable housing, right? Are, are, they, are they getting to your homeless shelter because they're out there so much? I, how, are, how is that group being handled? Your, this affordable housing, particularly when I see cars in the parking lot, these are people that must have jobs. And yes. I'll, I just I'll, wonder I'll how, colleague, how are all Mr. those Valdez other people that we all that. witness, how are they getting somewhere? Uh, none of us ever see that. So, Absolutely. Um, so what I would say to that is, you know, thanks to PSVS, the city over the past three years, you know, 2019 was when we really started to, to see the, the money come into the city. And so we've been able to completely transform the homeless services landscape. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of contrast to what was available before versus now. Uh, before you had just the mission and the Bakersfield Homeless Center, uh, Bakersfield Homeless Center serving women, mission serving single men, uh, just consistently full uh, every single night. And so uh, by the end of this year, uh, the city will have contributed to uh, in, in a large part thanks to PSVS, but also leveraging state, uh, state funds uh, to over 500 new shelter beds uh, by the end of this year. And so we've, we've been able to leverage PSVS to add new shelter beds. Uh, what we've also done is add street outreach to, to engage those folks and, and try to convince them to receive help. Uh, there was no, there was some street outreach, but not at the level that there is now because there just wasn't the shelter beds and the services uh, to bring them to. Um, so what the city has been doing is really getting at um, that whole continuum of care. Um, and so, uh, you know, I can share some of the results of, of the street outreach teams, uh, but we are funding folks that engage those individuals um, to, to try to get help. Uh, but what we're seeing is that, um, you know, there, there have been uh, a lot, those 500 shelter beds uh, are, are pretty much full um, and so what we're seeing now is a resistance because of substance abuse uh, and mental health issues. Um, and the city uh, has to rely on the county's uh, behavioral health and substance abuse department uh, to, to address those issues. And we have some really exciting partnerships as the chief uh, had mentioned uh, in the last presentation with uh, behavioral health and recovery services. Uh, the mayor has worked very closely with BHRS uh, to try to get them uh, engaged in innovative uh, programming uh, to, to, to try to get folks the help that they need. Uh, they just started Project Rome, uh, which goes out and provides uh, therapists directly to homeless people, the medicine directly to homeless people uh, to try to convince them to get care. But the resistance that you're seeing and that, that we uh, see as well is largely due to mental health and substance abuse, but uh, we're, we're, we're chipping away at it um, and we're seeing results. The people that you put into this housing, does anybody uh, follow up to see, I mean, I have apartments and I've got people with jobs and everything, and when they yeah. leave, I'm thinking, good grief, what a pig. Um, 
So who's on top of if we build this affordable housing that there's some responsibility there to not Th that, destroy it? That's a great question. So the first thing I would say is there's different types of housing. Um, there's permanent. There's permanent supportive housing on one end. You know these are the folks that you know uh, they due to substance abuse, mental health. Uh, you know, just chronic issues. Uh, they need assistance for the rest of their lives. Um, and so uh, the permanent supportive housing is where you have folks on site um, that really provide um, strong support systems. And these are the folks that you, you're seeing in downtown on the streets that are the most highly visible. Um, and so actually the city is using, uh, trying to use state grant funds uh, this year to try to jumpstart more permanent supportive housing so those highly visible folks that you see on the street um, receive the care. On the, other, on the other spectrum, side of the spectrum, you know, folks who are just down on their luck, right? Uh, you know, uh, something happened in their life, uh, you know, they lost their business, they lost their car. I mean, there's, you know, you hear so many stories of, of or they fell into drugs and they, you know, they, they've got their life back together. Um, the, the vouchers, when someone's placed into affordable housing, they're done so with a voucher. Um, and the city has contributed towards these vouchers. So when someone's placed in uh, affordable housing, uh, the voucher comes with casework. Um, and most of the casework is done by the Bakersfield Homeless Center. Um, they do it for, for all of the shelters. Um, and they have something in the 90% success rate of um, recidivism. Uh, for keeping folks in affordable housing because those caseworkers case go along um, with the folks that are that are placed in affordable housing. So, yeah. And, then, and you know, the other thing I would say, Member Abernathy, about affordable housing is what the city is doing is we're, we're investing in it, right? We, as you, as you saw a couple slides ago, you know, the city is investing one to three million in PSVS dollars. And what that does is that signals to banks, uh, you know, this is going to happen, right? Um, and then the housing authority has to go elsewhere to find the rest of the funding. Um, so what the city's really doing is just providing that seed money um, and, and, you know, getting these projects off the ground. Um, it is not our money that completely pays for these uh, affordable housing uh, projects. And we're using state money uh, for the caseworkers. So, you know, we're, we're, what we're trying to do as a city is really, you know, lay the foundation and, and as we've done over the past three years, um, you know, develop the, the continuum of care um, so that, you know, others can, can do the work, but we're just, we're giving it a jump start, I guess, if you will. Okay. Thank you. It's taxpayer money. It sure it's, is. It, it's not state money. It sure is. Everything is taxpayer money. So, okay. It is. Thank you. You're welcome. Committee Member Madland. Hi, I like your approach. Thank you. Because the issue is they're so, so separated. There's hard luck housing. There's mental health, which is a totally different thing. Usually drugs are involved. Uh, but the intelligence level of most mentally ill people are enormously high. Yeah, it sure is. And just programs to challenge some of that. Yeah. Um, but I, I agree, they're so totally different and they're always kind of lumped in. I have my little friends at Garza Circle who I go, you know, take food and say hi to. But, you know, they are mentally ill people. Yeah. Nonviolent. Um, but just engaging them in these programs, but getting more focused. Because I, you know, saw the police department is working with these different organizations who are really good at mental health issues. Yeah. And if you really don't throw a lot of money at that, I think you're going to be running around building places. I mean, you need to build them for homeless issues. But the mental health issue, I've dealt a lot with that. They are not going to go into housing. Yeah. They will not stay on their medication. And they're, I just like to see some of, a lot more of that money go to, you know, even, I don't know, make Bakersfield a pilot project project for mental health. I mean, it would be a great, let's throw some money at it and make a difference. And, you know, we can go, I mean, this, this, this money I see in here, I, my eyes are still spinning. Yeah. Since last week. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's just, I love your approach. But a lot of this money needs to go and be the focus on the mental illness 
thing that's predominantly Mike Garces guys and gals. Um, the right program, I mean, you guys have all your mental health experts, but it's, it's a very delicate balance. Um, and there's solutions out there. It's just, why don't Bakersfield, let's try a great mental health program. Give it a shot. You know, I see you got money in here to go clean up and pick up trash and, you know, bodily fluids. You know, I asked the guys down at Garces. I'm like, hey, what if we put a dumpster in a porta potty here? Would you guys throw your stuff in there? Yeah. Now, if somebody's going to say, oh, they're going to set it on fire. Oh, well, they're setting it on fire anyway. But then, you know, you got a refuse service, boom, boom, picks it up once a week, services these things, because you have high density areas. You can go kick them out and stuff because they, you know, they're messy. They are. <laughs> they just are. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the process. Yeah. You're not going to get your kid to make his bed. <laughs> Mentally ill people are not going to keep their area clean. But there's, I just see where smarter ideas could be focused. Well, I guess simple ideas, common sense ideas. Yeah, the, Try throwing some, you know, trash cans around. Yeah, th thank you, Committee Mayor Madeline. All right, I'm but, done. Sorry. We, we are on the same page. Uh, as we've looked really hard at this issue, there were some initial um, large gaps in the whole system to support homeless, and that was these emergency shelter beds. <clears throat> so we put a lot of funding towards the emergency shelter beds. But as we've addressed that gap, the two biggest remaining gaps are mental health and substance use. And so we're working really closely with behavioral health at the county. We're working close with some of our local hospitals around the substance abuse piece. And some of the dollars that you see, that you see in this budget are reflective of some of those efforts, even our homeless courts um, and the public safety you know, regional partnership that we've t been talking about gets you know, at that to a degree. Also, um, this is one piece of a really big um, context with the entire homeless collaborative. You know, we've got $8 million this year in um, taxpayer but state uh, funding between city, county, and the Homeless Collaborative, and we're talking about how do we put those towards these programs. A lot of it is mental health, to your point. And we've invited the, the Director of Behavioral Health from the county to this city council ad hoc committee to talk about their efforts that they're uh, undertaking. Some of this will take some actual state legislative changes, and we're advocating and pushing for some of those legislative changes uh, so that when we put our dollars to work, it's effective and meaningful. But uh, just to, to acknowledge to you that you're on point, that is one of our biggest gaps, and we're working that from several different angles, including PSVS, but definitely outside of PSVS dollars as well, because that is that those are our two biggest remaining gaps in getting at the homeless challenges, mental health and substance use. I agree, but also you have your friend's son is a drug addict. Totally different than a, than a mentally ill person who takes drugs to control their mind. So I think there's a really big cutoff there between drug abusers and people who have to try to use something to calm their mind, and, but, but that's a mental Ill, illness level. Uh, and I see a, a kind of a, a line there. Certainly, and, and the, the only other thing I would add is, uh, you know, uh, Count, Vice Mayor Weir is chair of the council's homelessness ad hoc committee, uh, which started meeting in January. Um, and the committee meets once a month, and the committee spent two months meeting with uh, the Behavioral Health and Recovery Services County Director um, in the month of, month of February and month of March. Uh, the next meeting is around uh, enforcement around homelessness. Um, and so, and yesterday, uh, the mayor was at a press conference where, uh, you know, she said essentially, you know, cities are bearing the brunt of the state's mental health and substance abuse crisis. Um, and, you know, the, the state and our county, uh, you know, we were open, as you said, to going big. Uh, we've signaled uh, to the state that, uh, you know, if, you, if there's any place to pilot a program uh, to address mental health, Bakersfield is it. Um, we, the city, has been open to, to any tools um, to help address this mental health crisis because uh, we're paying the price with our police response. 
uh, with our EM, EMS responses, with our parks, with our sidewalks. Um, and, you know, because we don't have a mental health uh, and substance abuse department, we really do um, have to, to turn to our partners uh, to, to help us address it. Uh, but we uh, have a really great relationship with the county uh, now in terms of homelessness. Um, and we have a very open line with our county mental health department and appreciate the, the innovative uh, initiatives of late um, that, that the city has been very willing to partner in. For example, we set aside two beds um, at the, the city's Brunage Lane Navigation Center uh, just for the county mental health department to, to place folks. So uh, we're open to any partnerships to really get at that mental health and substance abuse challenge. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go to committee member Singh and then committee member Coleman. Just one question, this Brandage Lane <clears throat> uh, homeless placement uh, thing which I was reading, uh, this will take all the patients like homeless people with mental health issues, right? Mental health and without mental health issues. And that Brandage Lane Center will accommodate pa uh, people with mental health issues and without mental health issues, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a whole spectrum of folks that come into our shelter. Um, like I said, some of them because they're just down on their luck. Uh, some of them because, um, you know, they have a very common uh, a very common type of individual that we would see at the city's Brundage Lane Navigation Center uh, is somebody who uh, had onset of schizophrenia, right? Schizophrenia typically comes on in the 20s uh, late 20s, uh, you know, and the family member just couldn't couldn't deal, right? Yeah. And so that person ends up on the streets. So, um, yeah. So do city have any plan of putting any case management on those type of people who have mental health issues? Because even if we place those patients or people in that particular center, if they don't take medications, they'll be back. Absolutely. So, uh, so at the Brunish Lane Navigation Center, uh, every individual is matched with the housing navigator, uh, which is uh, somebody who is the case manager. Um, and the reason they call them housing navigator is because the number one priority is getting them out of our shelter, off of our tab, uh, and into affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, but also the city has, it, one of the innovative things about the Brunish Lane Navigation Center is that it has Kern Medical, Behavioral Health and Recovery Services County Department um, and Department of Human Services on site where we can connect folks. Um, BHRS, the County Mental Health Department, is telling us they can only fund two group therapies a week. Mm -hmm. And so what the city is doing is we're actually using our state uh, grant money uh, to pay for, uh, for a mental health therapist a master's level therapist okay. um, in each of the four major shelters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and mental health has been the city's priority this year on addressing homelessness. So mm -hmm. the state funds that the city gets directly, uh, in addition to the permanent supportive housing, which I just mentioned, uh, the other priority is placing a mental health therapist um, in each of the, the city's four major shelters uh, because uh, right now it does take a while uh, for an individual to be uh, meet with the therapist, um, and so the city's stepping right in and saying, you know what, we can't wait. Um, we need to get folks matched with, with therapists to help them. Thank you. Of course. Committee Member Coleman. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I have a few questions, but I want to start out with a little, little story, and I'll keep it brief. Uh, we lost a family member this last year that... Uh, uh, passed away from a drug overdose uh, related to home, not related to, but she was also homeless and dealing with mental health issues. And uh, over the years, there have been many attempts to try to help her and uh, you know get her the treatment that she needed at that time. At the one time in her life where she was willing to entertain uh, some drug rehab, they only had outpatient program so it doesn't work for homeless people <laughs> all right uh, so I hope that we're gonna make some progress on that but my question uh, her, her issue was she, she was doing what Mary was talking about where she was actually self-medicating because you know she had voices and, and the whole thing uh, but she was very uh, resistant to any kind of assistance so anytime you approach her she'd get angry and sometimes violent and uh, you know we've at, we asked 
uh, Jim Wheeler and his group at Flood Ministries to go out and try to inter intervene with her. And she they were not successful. But my my point, that leads me to that issue of uh, conservatorship and being able to engage these people that uh, are, you know, we think that if we could have got her into a program for even a brief period of time, that we may have been able to get through to her and, and take care of her medical issues, and, uh, and and you know, and and then you know, get her on some kind of a path to to betterment, uh, but. Uh, the, the laws are very difficult when it comes to dealing with those kind of people. And so, and I know that there is some talk about making yeah. some changes in that regard. And what is the city or what is your group doing to advocate for those kind of changes? Well, Member Komen, uh, he almost brought me to tears because a member of my family OD'd on fentanyl this year um, as well. And uh, they were lucky enough to have the $15,000 uh, to go to rehab uh, if you are poor in this county, if you are a Medi-Cal recipient, uh, there is no inpatient uh, substance abuse treatment available to you. Um, and as you point out, uh, what is available is outpatient, um, and outpatient uh, is often a phone call a week. Um, and someone on meth or fentanyl um, is not going to be well served uh, or kick the habit on a phone call a week. It just ain't happening. Um, and so... Uh, we recognize that, you know, we recognize that the homeless individuals, what we're hearing from Flood Ministries, uh, our friends at Flood Ministries, is that uh, because of the 500 shelter beds that we uh, have added over the past two years, uh, you know, we're, we, have, we have placed a lot of people um, in, in, uh, in shelter. I know it doesn't look like it, uh, but the numbers are going to come out next week uh, on the homeless count. Um, and, and I, you know, I think we're going to see that we've, we've made some progress. Um, but what we're hearing from Flood is that uh, increasingly we're just receiving service resistance, and it's largely because of substance abuse issues. Folks, folks want to be on the street so they can continue to, to use. Um, and so uh, to answer your question, uh, we recognize that uh, the answer has to come from Sacramento. Uh, it really does. The laws have to change. Um, and the priorities have to change uh, from our state. And so, uh, you know, I also staff, uh, the, I also per, am uh, responsible for the city's legislative advocacy um, and staff the mayor on big city mayors. Uh, for the first time in recent history, the big city mayor sponsored a package of bills uh, in Sacramento. Uh, and uh, it's a series of bills uh, that get at this issue of, of um, you know, uh, Making services available. Um, there's another initiative by uh, the the governor called the CARES Court, um, which would compel counties and other agencies to provide these types of services. The courts will say you must uh, provide these services uh, to individuals, and so uh, largely through big city mayors, the city of Bakersfield is very involved in the conversation in Sacramento um, on on this issue because. Uh, you know, we are we are essentially just watching people uh, waste away on our streets, um, and and it's disturbing. Thank you. I know you're doing a lot of good things, and I'm I'm happy to see the things that we're doing. But I, I just wanted to, to ask a couple questions about Mr. Saldana's comments a, a minute ago. Uh, he, uh, you mentioned that you have 106 employees at the homeless. I, I didn't understand exactly what you were saying. Who are those 106 employees? Are they people that were homeless and we're now giving them jobs, or what is, what is that? Uh, I can get that. So uh, he, I, he was talking about the, the employees of the city's funded Brunage Lane Navigation Center. Um, the, the director of the, so who's employed? I'll, I'll first start off by, by what the staffing level is there. Um, you know, you have the executive director, you have the, the assistant director of the shelter, um, you have about six uh, housing navigators, um, and then you have uh, a logistics team. They, they're the ones that clean, go around, engage folks, and then we, we also hire private security. Um, and so, uh, so what, what we need to do is, uh, with the new space, uh, I, I also want to point out the Brunish Lane Navigation Center is the, the only shelter in uh, the region that keeps shelters open during the day. 
Um, and that's important because for seniors to convalesce, um, they actually prioritize placing seniors and those with, with difficulties at our shelter. Um, so in order to keep dorms open, in order to keep spaces open, and, and our BLNC is a contained closed campus. Uh, so if you wanna enter and exit, you have to do so on a shuttle or a car. Um, and that's a, that requires a lot of staff. Um, but it also means that we have a great relationship with our neighbors. Um, and so uh, with the expanded uh, staff, uh, we, are, we, we just need, with the expanded space, we need additional staff. Uh, the city's also looking into a couple uh, creative suggestions that came from Mercy House, which operates our shelter. One, to have um, a housing locator, uh, because uh, it's very difficult to place folks in affordable housing. We have something like 40 people in our shelter who have been matched with vouchers and affordable housing, but we just can't find the placement for them. And we want to get them out of the shelter uh, and off our tab again. Um, and so uh, we we're hiring an additional. So I'm going to cut you short in sure, the interest sure. of time. Because, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I acknowledge you guys are doing good work. I guess in my mind, I didn't realize that all these employees of the Brunswick Navigation Center were city employees. They're not. They're, They're we contract con employees. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we okay. contract with the this nonprofit. This is Mercy House. Mercy absolutely. House. Yes, sir. Okay, so we're just funding that ability for those people. Yes. So I guess, Mr. Saldana, how many people do you have in your department? We have uh, 20, our complement is 28, okay. uh, but three of them work in the uh, homeless services unit. And I, I do want to clarify, um, committee member, the, the number of 106 uh, was my reference to 106 uh, homeless individuals that work as part of a jobs program with Bakersfield Homeless Center, and they work in a variety of different uh, positions. So if, if I uh, confused that matter, I wanted to make that clarification. So those people get, uh, those are people that were homeless and now have jobs? That is correct. And, and then uh, who's paying for that? For those 106 people. So, uh, Are so we paying for that out of PSVS? Mostly. There's, uh, for the water department, it comes out of the enterprise fund. Uh, but those are folks that the city actually hires um, for uh, cleaning sumps, highway cleanup. Um, and so it's a pretty good deal. Uh, we're getting a pretty good deal on that. And uh, we're also uh, getting them and trying to graduate them into to permanent em employment. Are these people that you've hired that are formerly homeless are... Are they officially city employees and they get benefits and all that, or what's the deal on that? Uh, I can get back to you on the benefits question. I do not believe, no, uh, they're not getting benefits. And they're at will, so we can let them go if we run out of money? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and I, I wanted to get to two more points. I, I apologize for the time I'm taking, but... Uh, you mentioned that uh, you're adding 119 beds to the Brundage Street Navigation Center, uh, which seems like necessary because you say you're turning away 74. Is that every night? Or is that a monthly? Where do you put that number at? That's a week. Uh, okay, we're so getting you're turning away 74 a week. Yeah. What's happening to those people? They're just, you're just kicking them out and then... Or are you finding them alternate places for them to go? So that number comes to us from Flood Ministries. So those are folks that Flood has engaged that are willing to accept uh, services at the Brunswick Lane Navigation Center, uh, but we simply don't have the space. All right, thank you. And then the last question I have, you mentioned this homeless courts and, and uh, Chair Ortiz uh, was interest, is very interested in that program, but this is the first I heard about it. And I... I, I saw over here on the thing we received last week was a little bit of narrative about it, but it doesn't really get into any significant detail. And so I guess maybe can you give us a short version uh, of what this is and why it's going to cost us half a million dollars? The short version is because of uh, state policies on uh, criminal justice, uh, we have to be creative uh, in how uh, we engage folks. And the city is open to developing program. As I mentioned, uh, we're receiving service resistance. Um, you know, uh, state, state laws, uh, particularly Prop 47 and others, that don't compel folks uh, into drug treatment. Um, we have to come up with some innovative programming and ideas uh, to get those folks into treatment. Um, and so we're working really closely with the district attorney's office on coming up with programming um, to, to compel folks into to substance abuse treatment, or not, well, compel is not the right word, to, uh, to, to get folks uh, into uh, substance abuse treatment. Yeah, exactly, yes, sir. Exactly right, exactly right. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Ortiz, for uh, yes. your patience. Of right. course. Now, I think this is the top issue for Bakersfield citizens, so I think it's only um, right that we spend some time on it. I have just one question, um, and we can be brief here, but I mean, I, I think it's important to know just for the public and for the committee, I mean, the Brand Brundage Lane Navigation Center expansion, can somebody talk about how important having capacity there is to our enforcement protocols, especially around our no camping in parks, um, those types of things? Absolutely. So uh, about two years ago, uh, the, a federal court handed down what's called the Idaho decision. Um, and it essentially says that you cannot have strict enforcement unless you have uh, the capacity to provide services. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in 2000, uh, the last time we have a count before COVID, uh, there was 842 unsheltered homeless individuals in the city of Bakersfield. Uh, by the end of this year, we will have added 500 beds uh, and another 100 beds by the time the Bakersfield Homeless Center completes their campus for women and children. Um, so we are getting very close uh, to uh, having service available uh, to all the individuals, um, which will certainly help with enforcement. All right. Committee Member Madland. All right. Hey, I just, uh, there's a lot of money in this thing. Um, I'm just off the top of my head for common sense items. You know, I like the pilot program. I really do. There's, I think there's money here to do it. And if you start going down the line with mental illness, they're going to be the ones starting the fires. It involves our fire department. Mental health issues, you have police officers, sheriffs, 5150. They've got to drive them clear across the county to get them wait, get admitted, reports. That's a whole shift for a guy on one patient. Um, tying up the hospitals. I mean, you cannot get in a hospital, and I'm pretty sure it's tied up with a lot of mental health issues. Um, also, the ambulance. But we're already paying for that, so the money's all there. If done, you know, I just thank you guys for popping in there on that. Um, why not start moving towards a solution with this kind of money? I don't mean all of it, but certainly try. Because some of the numbers I've ran in here, on their way, the numbers aren't right. Well, and I don't know where that money goes, but it can certainly go through there, and it's going to help police, it's going to help fire, it's going to help the hospitals. I, I completely agree with you. The money's there. It, you know, so... So again, we're, we're pushing the state on a legislative level to, to, to be more outcomes-based um, and have mental health be outcomes-based. Um, and we're working with our partner, Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, on innovative programs that really get at uh, the issues. But I, I will say that you're, you're absolutely right. Um, when a 5150 call happens, um, our police department is engaged from anywhere from one to four hours or more. Um, and so uh, what, I th what will happen is, you know, if we start seeing more innovative mental health programming, uh, that'll mean that uh, response times by our police department are faster uh, because they're not tied up with 5150 uh, calls. And we, at, as you heard from the chief, uh, we have already started some innovative programming uh, in the call center where you have a huge number of calls diverted to a mental health professional. Um, so we're, we're chipping away and, and we're pushing our partners uh, to, to be better on this so that it opens up capacity for uh, response times for our public safety. Thank you, Anthony. And, and if I may, Chair, I'm going to suggest that, that we um, shift gears into our next topic and, and just maybe give some summary reflections for the, the committee. Um, the committee plays the three important roles and related to two of those important roles, one of those is to just provide feedback and ideas, and we've gotten a lot of really good feedback and really good ideas today. And um, I, you know, we're taking notes, and and you know, I'm I'm sure there will be follow-ups on many of these thoughts and ideas. I would just again remind the committee that the context of this proposal today is, you know, a couple of very specific asks, but we're spending eleven million dollars actually on homelessness in total out of PSVS uh, through f former allocations. The um, behavioral health um, budget for the county is five hundred and thirty million dollars. 
I think it's in the 200. Oh, excuse me, 200, 230 million dollars. And and this and our local hospitals spend millions, uh, county other departments spend millions, and so rest assured, city staff are working very closely with many of our other partners on a systems approach that gets at efficiencies to putting the dollars to their greatest uses. And there are many opportunities to get smarter and better. And some of that, again, it has to do with uh, the state um, parameters that are in front of us, and we're trying to get some of those shifted as well. The second important role of this committee is to identify whether or not funding proposals are consistent with the priorities of the measure. And so really with this ask is, are the dollars around homeless courts, are, are the dollars around Brundage Lane Navigation Center, are they consistent with one of the 13 priorities? And that's really the big decision in front of this group today, but appreciate the, the, the um, uh, helpful ideas and thoughts and feedback, but a really big topic that many folks, including council and the ad hoc committee are, are working on uh, in depth and at length. We've been talking quite a bit about uh, how do we um, prevent and, and intervene in homelessness, but also we, we know there's the impacts of uh, homeless individuals. And so Chris Boyle, our Development Services Director, is going to come and uh, provide this next segment that reflects on our rapid response teams, how they're uh, helping to address encampments and cleanup of homeless areas. As well, there's a couple of items for development services under quality of life uh, related to code enforcement. So he'll speak to those uh, different items and actually one piece on planning under that segment as well in this next set of presentation. Thank you, City Manager Clegg. And thank you for having me today to the Citizens Oversight Committee. It's a pleasure to be standing here and presenting to you. I'm going to go as fast as I can. Um, Development Services is making two separate presentations all in one as it relates to our efforts towards homelessness and um, our efforts towards um, quality of life issues in the community. When you look at the original goals of the Measure N, um, you can put arrows um, next to those goals that the Development Services Department is integrated within. So whether it's partnering with the fire department or the police department in homelessness responses or a a burn down or vacancies, whether it's helping with the parks department, with a homeless concern in a parks department, whether it's working even with the, the city attorney's office as it relates to the receivership programs and the like, the city, city's development service department is kind of a cog in the wheel and, and, and fills many roles as it relates to realizing um, PSBS goals. Last time we were here, your folks had some concerns. It was the first time you were on this board and you wanted to have an understanding of what happened before. And so last year when I was here, uh, Commissioner Prince was here at that time, I would make note. And last year we talked about the shortfall in, the, in, in manpower as it relates to code enforcement and how that code enforcement team was largely responsible for the response on boots on the ground responses to the homelessness efforts in the city. I noted at that time that we had uh, that a single code enforcement officer responded or served 165% more, more citizens than in our comparable cities on average, and that it covered more than 300% more surface area in the city um, than a comparable city did on average. Um, in response to that, I want to thank the, the positive recommendations that came out of that in adding six additional code enforcement officers two code enforcement officers and uh, two assistant, four code enforcement officers, two assistant code enforcement officers. And what I'm talking about today will demonstrate that the impacts those individuals have had over time. I would note too that you asked to know what the, where the rubber meets the road as, as it relates to money and especially ongoing expenses. And currently, my, I asked my business manager, Ms. Kotera, to provide me that number. And at this point in juncture, my department has ongoing expenses related to salary and um, benefits of $3.242 million um, out there with the math. So what does that mean? Once upon a time, a few years ago, we had 12 and Coast Enforcement Officers in this entire city. Was that working? No, it wasn't. Uh, today we have 16 Code Enforcement Officers dedicated to the North and the South. They're broken into teams of eight. There are, there are additional totals as it relates to administrative 
assistants that help keep all those citations and notices of violation and letters of support going where they're supposed to go. The RAP response team is entirely funded and built uh, with PSVS dollars. There are four teams. The fourth team will go live on Monday, the 2nd of May with new campaigns. And um, that team um, is uh, perhaps the spearhead in our homeless encampments efforts in the city. My proposal today is to ask for an additional four member team designed on efforts to enhance our efforts in solving our vacant building issue within the community. The numbers, a rapid response team had, uh, had 6,217 complaints last year or 17 complaints per day. It responded to 4,690 encampments or 13 encampments per day. We had 1,923 contacts with um, homeless individuals and we moved 5.93 million tons of trash. Uh, trust me, I, I did a recent visit to another city who doesn't have the type of resources that Bakersfield is involved in, and let's just say it looked like there were still 5.93 million pounds of trash in the downtown area of the community. We look at our encampment cleanup teams. Um, this is a before and after photograph, and so to put that into context, 4,690 times the rep response team and its cleanup arm responded to an encampment that went from that to that. I, I dare say I wouldn't want, want the rapid response team not being responsive to the homelessness efforts in the fair city of Bakersfield today. In terms of our, those 16 member code enforcement teams, eight in the north, eight in the south, they had 6,029 cases last year, which is 116 cases per week. And um, they performed 13, almost 14,000 inspections last year, about 268 per week. You might ask, well, how come it's, there's difference? Well, that's because we had a huge backlog in cases that hadn't been able to be resolved at the current staffing level prior. And so consequently, a big difference in that gap is our ability to close in our backlog of cases. So there has been major additions last year that resulted in improvements in service delivery. With RRT data included, the department overall had 12,246 cases or complaints addressed last year, or 235 per week. Currently right now, in the first three months of the year, we've had 2,029 cases um, in the first three months, and uh, those addressed everything from property maintenance to citizen complaints to zoning issues. We've had almost as much proactive work to begin the year than in all of last year, and that's a big part of the assistant code enforcement officers. This in-house training to bring about qualified people to do our code enforcement work, and uh, part of their training is in proactive work. Um, this year, at this time of the year, there's a lot of weed abatement. Those individuals have been out um, doing weed abatement as part of their ongoing training towards uh, gaining their necessary certifications to be a code enforcement officer. Which leads me to my ask. Um, in the last year, uh, Bakersfield building fires are on the rise. Um, from a sheer data perspective, in the first three months of the year, I've had 16 residential fires and eight commercial fires. and. And if you broke that out as a trend, that's an alarming trend over the course of a year. If I want to give away the advances we've made with the investments that we've made through PSVS support, um, I can shift teams onto that, but I will lose all of the advances that I've made um, providing for um, meaningful code enforcement um, within the community. Therefore, I ask for a four member team that will address vacant structures, abandoned, dilapidated, fire damaged properties. It also gives me some capacity for uh, proactive campaigns to address community blight, commercial signage issues, property maintenance and the like, and gives me important support moving forward with our receivership program. We're looking to establish uh, a more cohesive approach to our vacant and substandard properties in the city and this team is an integral component as to making that a reality. Thus, 
My ask this year for, for our code enforcement team as it relates to homelessness is a four, nine, 900 and change ask of which $468,361 would be on ongoing expenses. Would you bring my total investment by the, this, this board through PSVS to about $3.7 million annually? So let's look at our updated comparisons though. City code enforcement in terms of comparables with my comparable cities is still in the bottom third. It's 26% below my comparable cities in terms of overall code enforcement support. These are prudent asks. They're not uh, overreaching. Um, in fact, it's a little bit below what a comparable size city would have within code enforcement support. In terms of the area, I don't ever pretend to think that the city of Bakersfield will have a comparable service coverage area than most cities. It's a big town. But we have gone from one officer per 9.28 square miles down to 5.05, and I find that to be manageable. So major additions last year resulted in improvements in service delivery. The special project request retains gains in service levels plus added capacity and it allows for sustained efforts in abandoned buildings, proactive campaigns, and the like. Uh, the second half, or the, the last portion of my presentation, relates to the planning division, um, which has a specific ask. The planning division it, it has its hands in lots of things. And I'm going to take a brief moment to go through every one of these bullet points, or maybe not. Um, what I'm saying is, that the planning division is an integral component in delivering quality of life to the city of, city of Bakersfield. Uh, it, I'm sure that's not a single person in here knows all of the little things that the planning division touches upon, but they're important. Right now, that department is busy, has been busy since the day I came to work here a little less than three years ago. Our revenue projections are almost $350,000 over our original projected budget. Um, and that's not to mention the fact that it has an ongoing general plan update that's a multi-year process, a six-cycle housing element, a climate action plan, a municipal services review, a Bakersfield Habitat Conservation Plan, and we're going, on, we're going live in the start of May with our online permitting and plan checking program. Um, that's a return on investment right there. But when we look at our comparables, the six cities around us have 27 members in their planning staffs, and this city has 16. Um, so my ask is, I feel that, um, that an ask for one additional associate planner from the support of the measure and planning and vital services measure um, is a prudent request. Cumulatively, I have one million, just over one million in asks this year. I request your support of that. About 570,000 is a recurring cost. Um, that completes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Any questions from my colleagues? Ms. Matland. Well, I just looked at your numbers because I'd been looking at um, some other vehicle numbers and, and things that I know a little bit about, but your numbers are right on as far as your vehicle purchases you know the um the salaries and the long-term investment is a oh it was you good job <laughs> there's some others for you to look at then you can bid them uh, i'm cognizant of where the money comes from thank you we try to spend it wisely you actually you, you did because uh, some of the other numbers i've seen are almost twice of what the vehicle costs uh, but anyway I thought it was good. And it's nice to see that you have someone on your staff that absolutely did a good job. Thank you. You're welcome. Gold, gold star, Mr. Boyle, for you and your business manager. <laughs> any, other, any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Um, I'll go to com Committee Member Prince and then Vice Chair Abernathy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, great presentation, sir. Uh, the only question that I do have is in regards to your total special project operations cost, mm -hmm. um, which you indicated is a one-time uh, cost of 150000 right. Um Just a little explanation in regards to that. And if these costs, although they are a one-time cost, but if 
every year if you come back to the measure in for these types of costs, and they actually are not really one-time costs if, the, if we funded these types of costs similarly in the past, correct? I understand, and thank you, Commissioner Prince. I want to note that Commissioner Prince, last year after my presentation, asked me, do you need more help? Here I am, Commissioner. <laughs> um, that said, the $150,000 is going to cover a broad brush of things. Whenever you do a, a, for instance, when you do a receivership, there's ancillary costs that come with it, whether it's with lick guarantees, uh, purchasing of um, preliminary title reports and the like. When you have a burn down, you know, the fire department comes and puts it out and we say yes, but that's when code enforcement has to start working, whether it's a board up, if it's, if it's ultimately condemned, then um, we, we have the, we oftentimes shoulder the cost of the demolition. We shoulder the cost of the inspections for asbestos and the like. And so if you just took that based on our trend line, I see that as maybe being able to satisfy, if we don't have a lot of asbestos and other issues associated, maybe 10, 10 properties where the property owner is non-responsive to abating, um, abating the issue and the city has to step in and, and cover those expenses, that's where that $150,000 comes into play. It may be used, it may not be used, it may be enough, it, it may not be enough, we think it's a prudent start. And if I may ask, what happens to that property owner um, if, he is, if he or she is now responsive um, to those costs um, and the city is now affording uh, that, that particular expense or handling that particular expense, how does that affect that property owner moving forward? That property owner's title is, is clouded. There's a lien placed on it for the costs that were incurred in bringing that property into compliance. Thank you, Committee Member Prince. Vice Chair Abernathy. Nope. All right. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you. I think we caught up. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Uh, this will now shift gears um, into uh, quality of life. And we'll invite uh, Rick Anthony to come and share a presentation. There may be one transition slide, Rick, if you could hit the forward button and see. Oops. Nope, we're right on to parks and quality of life. Rick Anthony. Good afternoon, chair and committee members. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present one more time in front of you. Uh, Wanted to highlight, and we'll get right through it. I just want to thank my colleagues for getting all the tough stuff out of the way so we can have some fun and breeze through these, right? Uh, here are our community priorities we have, number 5, 12, and 13. Uh, all of our uh, requests involve capital improvement projects. Uh, many of these projects are long overdue. Uh, wanted to highlight a few of them in a moment, but also just give the, some information that uh, many of these projects were vetted through our elected representation, also through some support from their constituents. So with the, uh, in concert effort with the city manager's office and elected representation is what we have today in terms of priorities for uh, 22 and 23 requests. Uh, Again, not, highly, not talking about every project, but highlighting just a few. Uh, Mesa Marin Complex is an ongoing uh, improvement efforts that we have. Uh, this is actually the final phase. Uh, initially, uh, the money that we had uh, initially budgeted was a little bit underfunded in terms of what the actual costs were. So this represents the final phase, phase three. Uh, it will build out four additional softball fields, concession, sports lighting, and associate parking. Uh, there, there is opportunity for future expansion. However, that has not been approved at this time, and this kind of represents the finish of the original concept. Uh, MLK, we're certainly excited about uh, this park reimagining. Uh, this actually got started from this very committee about three years ago prior to me joining uh, the team here, uh, possibly uh, committee member Prince and committee member Perez Andreessen would recall 
that there was some interest in reinvesting in certain areas of our city, uh, especially the east side, uh, in comparable some of the significant investments we were making in the new sports complex, both Kaiser and Mesa Marin, as we just mentioned. So we are very excited to be here uh, at this point uh, and just give you a little background of how we got here and what this funding request represents. Uh, when I came on, we started a, our parks citywide master plan, uh, but I believed in working with the city manager and talking to a lot of constituents out there. There was enough justification to carve out one particular park and put it on a fast track. So si simultaneously, as we were working through our complete comprehensive plan, we pulled out MLK, and that's working on a separate track right now. We are in the middle of public engagement. We just launched last Friday, had a huge event at the park, I believe about 1,000 participants. Uh, we have our consultant, MIG, uh, who's doing a tremendous job with both plans right now. Uh, we anticipate to be done with the conceptual phase late summer, early fall. Uh, from that point on, we want to move right into design. So the funding that we're asking today will get us to the point where we can do design docs, environmental reviews, and construction documents with the hope of having uh, it ready for next fiscal year, being prepared for the construction and the reimagining of that particular park. Uh, this is an ongoing project to improve access and parking lots. Uh, I believe we have funds allocated last year and there was a, a bit of savings in those funds. So we decided to continue to move on with this program. Uh, this is a focus on the Kern River Parkway, the Truxton uh, area, which I believe originally was done in 1991. Uh, and so as you can see the condition that it's in, it's been 30 years. Uh, so we want to continue that ongoing effort to uh, improve our access. Uh, this project here, Sister Cities Gardens, is fairly new. Um, uh, most of you probably have visited the, the, this facility and probably recognize over the years the historic investments that we made uh, certainly is not keeping up with what we envisioned it uh, to be. Uh, it is a, a very difficult place to manage in terms of uh, litter and homelessness. Uh, so our thought, uh, again, in concert with the elected representation and, and other citizens, our thought was we would secure this facility, uh, get it cleaned up, and reactivate this space, potentially for special events, uh, maybe even have some public hours, but it's certainly needed, and we hope that once this sprucing up and, and securing it with wrought iron fencing uh, would be able to reattract a lot of the crowds there and... Uh, and get at some of the issues that we're challenged with in, in that particular area. It's not just this one area, there's also another spot across the street that we believe these funds will contribute to securing as well. Again, just ongoing improvements in parks. Uh, the, the fence here has been vandalized several times since I've been here, literally just cutting through the chain link fence. Uh, the restrooms are certainly aged. Uh, and we hope to replace the fencing with the wrought iron and redo the entire restroom facility. An example of our playground rehabs, uh, we're doing a tremendous job. I think we have 12 or 13 playgrounds that are currently in some phase of construction. Uh, the request that's in front of you today will add two more, and this gives you an example of what they looked like before uh, and how the new facilities are keeping up with not just ADA, but providing a lot more shade than we've had in the past. And that is my presentation and certainly open for any questions. If I may real quickly, Chair, I want to make just two overarching observations on quality of life and parks investments. In prior years, um, there has been a focus on catching up on deferred maintenance. We had a number of parks that you know, had issues that had gone many years unaddressed because there was not um, the funding available. We've actually caught up largely on that deferred maintenance and some of the interest of the committee uh, last year was how do we go up beyond just replacing like for like and basic? 
and this slate of projects uh, does that in several um, of the, the proposed projects where we're actually making upgrades, we're making enhancements and not just catching up on deferred maintenance. And so we feel very excited and positive about that, that we're, we're making new progress. Beyond that, I would also just say that you know we, we know uh, public safety, homelessness, and I would probably suggest even economic development are big focuses for um, public safety vital services dollars. But r related to this topic of quality of life and parks and the next topic of infrastructure, these represent one-time investments. This is uh, a big return on that investment that we're able to do with one-time dollars that don't have those ongoing impacts. And we're trying to watch closely those ongoing dollars um, because we know we have to um, not over leverage the ongoing expenses. And so it does uh, create opportunities for us to get at infrastructure and quality of life in meaningful ways because there are one-time costs. Thank you, Mr. Anthony and Mr. Clegg. I'll turn to my colleagues for any questions or comments. You know, I have questions on everything. So <laughs> <laughs> Committee Member Coleman, go for it. <laughs> All right, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, we had a conversation not too long ago about uh, the whole parks thing and about uh, what our uh, what our vision is for the parks. And I know that you're. I, I, I understand you're working on a comprehensive park plan. That's when's that going to be completed? Do you? That's a great question. Uh, we are right now in the public engagement phase and I actually brought some flyers, so I'll share them with you all okay. if you're interested. We just did kind of a soft launch. Uh, our website is up and running. We have surveys for the public. That will be an ongoing effort through the fall, and then there will be some recommendations and implementation phases of the program, and we hope to have it in front of council by next summer. And that will be something that will be part of the general plan? Yes, it will okay. be an element of the general plan. Do you have an architect on your staff? I do not. Okay. Do we have park standards for parks, like, you know, planning standards and tree standards, those kind of things? We do have some antiquated standards. Okay. Um, it's been kind of improved upon here or there, but that is a component of the master plan so that we can bring that up to uniformity. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll save my comments about the, the parks for, for another time, but sure. uh, uh, these, these sound like worthwhile projects to me. I know that, that Martin Luther King Park, uh, I was shocked by it the first time I went and looked at it, and that was actually at the beginning of this uh, Measure N stuff, and I, I, I just didn't realize how poorly it had uh, declined yeah. uh, over the years. So I'm glad to see that we're, in fact, when Councilman Arias got elected, I, I went and met him and we met over there because <laughs> it, it was so bad. So I'm glad to see that we're putting some effort into that park. So that's uh, all my comments. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And then, um, Mr. Anthony, do you mind just walking through just, I mean, what are the other sources of revenue or funding for park improvements other than PSVS? And like, I mean, I guess the general fund provides some, but I'm sure you guys are going after state grants. I know there are like some park fees that some developers pay, but I yeah. mean, how does that relate to the we actual burden <laughs> of maintaining and managing this park system? Yeah, we do have fees that we collect. Um, and again, that is also a component of the master plan because it's, it hasn't been sustainable in terms of getting all the parks done. Uh, but we do work uh, very closely with economic development to see if there's opportunities. There are some state grants that we hope to tap in for MLK. It is a, a very strong focus of, of opportunities there. Um, so, you know, right now, any place that we can uh, collaborate or work with, we're certainly focused on using those additional funds instead of just putting the entire burden on this particular fund stream. Colleagues, any? Can you remember Matt Lund? Uh, first of all, I'd like to know who did that road in 91, and I want their number <laughs> <laughs> right now. And call Senator Grove and Assemblyman <laughs> Fong, Mayor Go, because ours only lasts about six months and it doesn't rain. So. Okay. I want that. Who, uh, 
I know you're going to be redoing all these parks. What are you going to do in, in regards to water? And water? Mm -hmm. uh, specifically our conservation efforts? Is that what you're speaking about? Well, on? I mean, it's expensive and yeah. maintenance. And, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's several initiatives that we're rolling out. Um, uh, first of all, we already have been proactive in reducing our water uh, by closing an additional day at, for the spray parks. We plan to continue that effort. We are working with Cal Water as well to try to reduce the turf. Uh, the turf in our medians and our common areas take a great deal of irrigation. And if we can convert that into some drought tolerant landscape, certainly that'll realize some savings there. And then, you know, we continue to work with the city manager's office and other departments to find opportunities where we can do our part in conserving it. Yeah, it's a shame to shut down the. Yeah, the it water, it's the uh, regular. Yeah. Maintenance, but I really want to know who did that road. Yeah. Um, how many square feet is that fence over at the Sister Cities Park? And I, what's the, did you get a, a cost per square foot on that? Yeah, we used a, an example of a recent estimate we had at Saunders. Uh, it, it's really tricky there because there's some different uh, topography issues, mm -hmm. we may have to go up and down, and we haven't completely vetted exactly where the fence is going, but I can get you those details from our, our planning and construction supervisor and uh, be happy to share that with you. Yeah, because I, I go by this, you know, I have my um, Garza Circle guys, so I go by this park also, sure. east side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that, pl that thing, it's really cleaned up. I just went by there. My dog goes to dog care there. Okay. And the park looks amazing, and yeah. it's very clean. Yeah. We try. It has its ups and downs. It very depends clean. on what day of the week you visit it, but we certainly are very responsive when the issues uh, uh -huh. present themselves. Let me see what else. Um, Jeff Jefferson Park. And actually, um, Martin Luther King. King Park. What are your plans for fencing? For fencing? Mm -hmm. uh, at Jefferson, I, we just talked about protecting the pool. Is there any specific fencing issues that well, you're concerned with? I've had to go to, a, I know, you know, it doesn't look great, and I didn't want my, my place to look like that, but we went to electric fencing. Okay. It's leased. They take full liability. Any maintenance is taken care of. I mean, we've still had someone cut it one day when it was yeah. off, but the deterrent I was getting broke into four days a week yeah. went to zero. Yeah. Um, so I think, but it does work. I mean, you don't want to build this wonderful place and, you know, a cyclone, they're, they're going to cut through. doesn't matter. You're going to fix it every day. Uh, rod iron, a little better, but they can get over it. Um, well, I think that... Because I've had all of them. If you go to, if you <laughs> go to MLK... No, it's, I mean, there's great points. If you go to MLK and you see the, the type of wrought iron that we put there, um, and we really have zero issues compared to a place like Jefferson, it is very difficult to get over those. We, we leave the top rails uh, exposed. I mean, they're not sharp, but they're definitely difficult to, to get over. And then in terms of cutting, very difficult to cut. So we've just kind of looked at some of our successes, and we're trying to migrate to make sure Saunders is a great example because we constantly get vandalized there and we do have a project already approved to put rod iron around there and we certainly hope to turn that around very quickly. We just uh, made investments in a new sports court and it's already been vandalized. So that just gives you an, an idea of the urgency and it's just one, one particular solution but we're certainly open to hearing others. Is this on the bike path also? Your under your wheelhouse? Yes. Okay. How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, ongoing efforts. Uh, I do feel very uh, uh, confident and optimistic uh, because we've made that a, a very strong scope in our master plan update in terms of both uh, planning for restoration projects there and, and obviously, uh, and thank you all for the support for the Ranger program because we plan to patrol uh, the parkway very heavily through that particular program multiple times on a daily basis. So I believe all those efforts working in concert is gonna get at some of the, 
the issues, along with all the other city efforts that are focused on uh, the riverbed and the parkway. Um, so we're excited to, to get down and get our, you know, put our sleeves up and get to work with the rest of them. I would add for the benefit of the committee members, last year's oversight committee um, actually had made a recommendation uh, related to one funding source for um, uh, highway court or hardscaping and said that's not the, uh, the highest priority we're hearing in the community. It's really the river area because it's deteriorated significantly. And so uh, we actually took $2 million of PSVS funds last year reallocated those towards um, the river parkway in a, a variety of uh, uh, ways. One was this fourth rapid response team to have a dedicated team to addressing homelessness within that river area, a contract with flood ministries to increase outreach efforts in the river area, and a few additional parks employees for um, the zone that's responsible for the river area to help um, you know, in those maintenance and sprucing up efforts of that river area. So we, we had a, a comprehensive package to help restore and better maintain the river uh, area in last year's budget through this uh, body. And uh, I would just note that we've seen some of the progress towards that, but we actually haven't really seen felt the full impacts of that yet because we've still been hiring up and getting all those resources deployed. So I'm, I'm also optimistic that um, the resources from this last fiscal year are still gonna have positive impacts in the river area going forward. Um, what I was talking about where mm -hmm. there's some projects where it kind of starts and stops, yeah, pieces of the bike path. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's. I just got my yeah. check the other day, so I'm all right. <laughs> but it only goes around my facility and stops. It goes from one fence to the other. Are you speaking of uh, maybe an internal trail somewhere, mm -hmm. not the parkway? Bike path. Yeah. I just I, wonder how many programs versus waiting and doing it all. Yeah. Or something, and then the um, beautification project on 99. I mean, there's so many. Fresno County and different counties with a zero scape is so much better. It doesn't hold the trash. Yeah. Nevada. Uh, we, so. we would just say amen. Yeah, <laughs> and no broken sprinklers. Yeah. So. Yeah, we are working to, um, th that's sort of a, a pilot concept and you'll see it you know, in the in coming slides, some information about that, but our, our goal is over time to phase that out throughout the entire corridor because it just is a better look and feel, much easier to maintain. Just cut the water off. <laughs> All right, um, but I think uh, committee member Prince was first oh, and then. Sure. Yes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Anthony, thank you for the presentation today. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have a uh, question, more or less a, of a comment in this probably uh, each year that I've been able to uh, serve in this committee, I've stated this in regards to your particular um, department. Um, hopefully in the, the master plan um, that will be uh, produced, that there will be some, some consideration for all of the uh, swimming pools that um, years ago they actually closed, yeah. uh, particularly on the uh, inner cities, whereas um, that was a prime uh, opportunity for recreation for the kids and youth in those areas yeah. and um, the spray parks I'm sure are, are fine <clears throat> and great a lot of fun um, but still uh, there's a, in my opinion there's a lot more benefit from learning how to swim and, yeah. and more of a physical uh, recreation as well so hopefully uh, in the next few years we can also consider reopening those pools that were closed years ago yeah. as well yeah. thank you yeah and, and just to tag on to that, I believe that was more of a cost uh, savings effort. And uh, there's already been some public uh, discourse with the consultant about uh, if, if not bringing back the same pools, but certainly addressing the lack of pools in the city. So we'll see how that goes. Thank you. Vice Chair Abernathy. When I, when I look at these park repairs and damage to bathrooms and pothole in a park, and my whole problem with the park ranger system was, where's the assessment of how many people use these parks? Whether repairing the bathroom is going to bring me back with my kids versus it's just, 
I'm not going there if, if I see trouble in the park, and these park rangers, of course, can't remove trouble. Um, how, where's the assessment of the money you're spending on a park that's going to get destroyed, the bathroom, in a year or two, versus how many people in this 400,000 city use it? Um, that's, to me, really important to assess because you could keep spending money repairing all this damage to a lonely place that people can do stuff at because you can't watch them all night. Yeah. So I, that concerns me when I see a place that, particularly if a lot of people aren't using it, are we solving anything by repairing yeah. the bathroom, for example? I, I, that's a great question. If I can kind of put it a different way, um, I believe that the main reason people don't come to the parks is because of those very issues. And a matter of fact, if you recall just my justification for the Ranger program, I even made mention we need to stop investing in our parks if we're not going to protect those investments. So I believe the, the Ranger program will be effective. I believe our efforts to renovate our amenities will be effective, and we're doing other things. We're partnering with certain communities to adopt the parks. We're getting people out there to activate them again, and I, you know, I strongly believe that every park deserves to be safe and deserves to be beautiful, just like you have parks in certain areas. So um, there may be smaller parks that don't get the use as some of the bigger parks, but I believe that all the parks have uh, some capacity for use if we're just taking care of them in the right way. Could, could your park rangers survey every day when they work? Absolutely. And people that are not damaging it versus people maybe that oh, are. Yeah. So, we, so we know, because yeah. I think that's a real issue of, of yeah. if we're fi fixing a prehistoric place anymore. Yeah. If, you know, yeah. so, okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Committee member Madland. Is this the program that has the four ranger pickups? I'm sorry? The four Ford Ranger pickups? Uh, it, no. It is, it is not. That's our next segment. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Is that it? it uh, well, for, for, for clarification, the, what's proposed in this budget, it, it, that's the park rangers do have trucks, but that's not in the numbers right. in front of the group for this cycle. The, the Ford Rangers you're referencing are, are, or there's actually some for development services, which was presented earlier, and one for um, public works. Are you referencing from this? The, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That's actually for our code enforcement officers, and that would be Mr. Chris Boyle. Uh, I'm, maybe you could point to us the, in the specifics, but, and we'll follow up with you. Um, I actually, I'm going to cover just two other programs that are in our quality of life that didn't fit within some of the other presentations for today. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Um, the, and you can leave it up there, Rick, because the next pre presenter. So um, referenced also in our materials is a, a cat spay and neuter program. We did a pilot last year, $50,000. Uh, this is really important to actually reduce the number of um, feral cats and also the number of uh, just uh, unaltered animals in the community. And these prevention methods have proven to have significant impacts on the number of animals that are on the streets and into our shelters. And so this is an important prevention tool that we think we can expand uh, this year from the good results we saw this last year. The public art program as I presented this to the city council in early April, uh, there's two elements to this. Uh, one is um, the ability to create art installations along with significant city infrastructure projects that may be uh, large road, road projects, that may be actual city facilities, uh, but getting at uh, public art in ways that we have not traditionally done. The other portion is to actually have a smaller segment of this. It will probably be somewhere in the range of you know three hundred to five uh, to four hundred thousand dollars of this allotment. We're going to do a solicitation from the local art community for some of the murals and public art pieces that are already planned in some of our neighborhood revitalization efforts and so forth. Supports local artists, supports our local art institutions as well as providing those actual installations. Uh, one might uh, ask, why are we doing public art with our public safety vital services tax dollars? 
uh, the, in the big picture of this $100 million budget, it's a small amount uh, f to get at quality of life and sense of place. It is my opinion, same, similar to the violence prevention dollars that we spoke to in our last presentation, until we get at issues like economic development, quality of life, and sense of place, we're going to continue to have challenges around public safety and homelessness because we need to get at the underlying quality of life in our community and create great places and great sense of place. And that's going to increase our economic development, increase our tax base, and ultimately make for a better place to live. So it is my argument that it is a good return on investment for those dollars. That's just a quick overview of those two programs. And could pause there for any questions, and then we'll shift into infrastructure with Public Works. All right, Greg Strakalous, our Public Works Director, will speak to our, many of our one-time infrastructure items and a few other pieces. Thank you, Mr. Clegg. Uh, Chairman Ortiz, committee members, Greg Strakalous. Um, for the past three months, I've had the pr privilege of working with some dedicated, hardworking individuals in the Public Works Department, dedicated to serving the mission of developing, managing, and maintaining city infrastructure, and also city programs for the community in a sustainable and cost-effective way. So this presentation goes over four points, and I'll move rather quickly. Um, we do want to talk about the PV PSVS priorities, how we've designed projects to align with these priorities. Um, many of the projects I'm about to present are multi-year projects. So they've started in a previous year and have already been designed to align, but there are some new projects that have been designed to align with priorities. And, and not just the PSVS priorities, but also city council goals. <clears throat> so one of the things I wanted to highlight uh, thanks to PSVS, uh, the Clean Cities Initiative has been a tremendous success in terms of cleanup efforts throughout the community. Um, the city clean, clean City Initiatives uh, engages with the con contractors, uh, six teams of contractors who go out into the field uh, to clean up efforts in a essentially what's been reactive uh, through our Bas Bakersfield mobile app. Uh, and through coordination with the rapid response teams, the police department. Um, we do coordinate with the Bakersfield Homeless Shelter and also the California Highway Adoption Company for this. Uh, we do want to expand this particular program, and I'll get into the details of that a little bit later. Uh, some of the numbers of the Clean Cities Teams project. Uh, you see the totals out there, 76,000 bags of trash, over 2,000 carts, mattresses, box springs, couches, and uh, miscellaneous waste and discarded materials throughout the community that's been uh, picked up, all thanks to PSVS funding on this. This has been the catching up on cleanup, I call, I call it. Uh, this is where illegal dumping and discarded materials have been left behind, and uh, also going after encampment waste. Uh, you've seen previous pictures of that as well. Um, I, I do want to talk about the pop-up drop-off events, which are, have been, also been very successful, coordinated through the Solid Waste Division of Public Works. These events occur essentially one to two times per month. Um, we try to get the notice out, uh, and it, it really is a great opportunity for folks to come to these events and drop off their, un, their discarded materials. Um, it's a level of service that goes a little bit above what solid waste currently provides in that we do allow for folks to call in once every quarter to, for the solid waste division to pick up uh, two bulky items per quarter. So this actually goes beyond that. It's a self-haul operation, and we're also going to be requesting a little bit uh, more funding for this particular program. It's my hope that we can move from the clean cities approach to the pop-off, drop-off uh, approach 
which is a much more proactive and do the right thing approach. Uh, just briefly, some other project highlights. Fleet Services Building Remodel. Currently, uh, City Council has just awarded a contract uh, with additional police officers coming to the force. They're going to need additional patrol cars, and those patrol cars need to be ma maintained. We do have a fleet auxiliary building at the police department. Uh, this project expands the number of bays that we have there to service those vehicles much more quickly uh, and get, get ahead of proactive maintenance. We have a bike and pedestrian street improvements along Chester Avenue. We have acquired grant funding to help with some improvements for pedestrian and bicyclists on Chester Avenue towards the south. Um, this particular fiscal year, $350,000 has been allocated towards designing a, uh, street improvements along the entire corridor from Truxton down to Brundage. And um, we're working through a final design process and uh, hope to be in construction uh, the winter of, of next season on Chester Avenue. Additional project ups, up, up, uh, updates. Um, first impressions and sense of place as you come into the city of Bakersfield along the freeway system. Uh, the Westside Parkway landscaping project, $2.65 million was allocated towards um, hardscape and softscape improvements, drought tolerant uh, uh, landscaping. And um, that is a project that is currently underway and bidding is expected by the summer this summer. Um, also, State Road 99, Hosking Landscape Phase 1. Um, Caltrans had a project to improve the interstate out there, and while they were doing that, uh, the, the severe drought conditions occurred, so they were scaling back their landscaping plan, essentially bringing in truckloads of mulch. Uh, what we did is provided an alternative design to that landscaping plan that really focused more on the hardscape and drought-tolerant landscaping, and Caltrans is working with us in a partnership to convert their landscape plan to implement our landscape plan. Uh, and $750,000 has been contributed towards that effort. And also there's the State uh, Road 58 corridor enhancement uh, project at $2.3 million. We're currently in a um, design process to identify a template for what those hardscape and landscape improvements look like. Um, Another project update has to do with a city street and a county facility at the Kern County Homeless Navigation Center. Um, this was a $260,000 project where the street was taken from what you see on the left, um, not much of a street, to what we do consider a, a nice, nicely paved street. Um, so getting into the proposed requests, uh, for the ongoing request, we're looking at three, adding three additional clean city teams at $750,000. Um, we're also looking at clean city uh, initiative pop-up events, adding $25,000 to help make those more successful. And a four-wheel drive pickup truck uh, that will allow um, us to haul our all-terrain vehicle uh, to get at the hard-to-reach places uh, along the, the bike path and other areas of the city that are a bit more hard to get to. <clears throat> um, the other list of projects that we have, uh, starting at the top, uh, grant match fund. So from time to time we do, we are successful in getting grants, and some of those grants require a local match, and this is an opportunity to match those grants. Other times we've applied for grants years ago that are for projects, and those project costs have escalated. So where those costs have escalated and bids are coming back, uh, this is also an opportunity to put forth some funding to complete the project. Um, number two is Bicycle and Pedestrian Facilities Grant Match, a $4 million request. Uh, unfortunately, Bakersfield is ranked second in the country um, uh, by the uh, American, I'm sorry, I forgot. It's the Smart Growth by America. Uh, they've created a study uh, called Dangerous by Design. And uh, Bank Bakersfield, the metropolitan Bakersfield area, has ranked second as one of the most dangerous places for pedestrians. Um, it's 11th ranked in the country as most dangerous for bicyclists. 
And uh, again, it's, it's by the design nature of the roadway system and the transportation system. You know, the culture years ago was to build the roads to uh, shorten a, a motor vehicle's delay to get freight moving, get people moving on the roads with very, very little consideration for other modes of transportation. And, and now the culture's changing. So, um, and uh, what we're trying to do is catch up because there are safety issues out there in the transportation system that we want to correct. Um, and this is an opportunity to do that. Uh, bike path beautification on the Chaco Road uh, between Stein and Weibel. Uh, again, that's, that's a project where the bike path is in place, but there's very, very low level street lighting. It's a pathway close to the road. Uh, vehicle speeds are, are relatively high and we want to make safety improvements and some landscape improvements on that particular project. Um, oops, sorry, didn't want to go too far here. Uh, gateway beautification project that uh, supplements underfunded capital improvement program projects that support needs for gateway routes. Uh, I'll move a little bit quicker here. Street light project. Uh, again, street lighting helps deter uh, crime and also helps improve safety in terms of crashes. So we have a multi year street light project program. Uh, West Side Parkway landscaping phase one additional funding. Uh, that's $250,000. Um, this is to supplement the previously approved uh, Westside Parkway landscape project. Um, in the last year, costs or uh, consumer price index have increased about 8%. So the value of money today is 8% less than it was a year ago. Um, additional median funds. Uh, again, we want to take a look at uh, landscaping or hardscaping some of the medians or actually creating medians where we have uh, just the center open lane. Uh, we want to advance a, uh, Americans with Disability Acts programs where we're building uh, safer roads for uh, Americans in, in the community who have disabilities. Um, uh, additional, uh, uh, the annexation fund is one in which uh, there are some legal descriptions that are needed for projects, but also when it, properties are, are areas of the unincorporated car county are annexed, there are some opportunities to improve infrastructure at that point. Um, cross crosswalk repainting and then other innovative approaches to getting people safely across the streets, disadvantaged neighborhoods and, and alleyway street funds, that's essentially improving the alleyway system in those disadvantaged neighborhoods. And uh, downtown corridor enhancements are directly associated with the um, Chester Avenue and H Street corridor streetscape improvements. Here are some uh, photographs of some of the, the median concepts that we're looking at uh, for improvements. Some of the conceptual traffic calming approaches we could implement throughout the community. Oops, there was one and also some of the ADA improvements we could make without, within the community. That concludes my presentation, and I stand by for questions. I'll turn to my colleagues. Good questions about pickups. <laughs> oh, it was from someone else. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right thing. Um, the annexation fund, what is that? I'll take that one, and Greg has done a great job of describing something that I encourage to be included in this piece. So uh, if you look at the pattern of city-county throughout the metropolitan area, there are significant areas that are county unincorporated. And so the city is actually pursuing a fairly proactive approach to try and incorporate those county unincorporated areas that are, and not on the edges of the city, but right in the middle of the city, we have all these pockets that are county pockets and we're trying to annex those in. Um, our ability to move more proactively on that is hindered by our ability to, um, th there's actually some fairly notable costs in providing legal, legal descriptions and um, doing the paperwork and applications of those. Some of that is done in-house by our city staff, but a lot of that we contract out. And so this would provide some funding to go through a next round of annexations that we're expecting in this next year as well. But that's actually a small amount. That's really in the $50,000 range. The rest of that funding is actually 
to be available. Typically when we do these annexations, and we did one large one um, uh, a year ago, and we've done several small ones this year, we're bringing in areas that often don't have curb gutter sidewalk, they don't have street lights, often the roads are in disrepair. So this would set aside some funds for us to be able to bring those areas up to city standards from an infrastructure standpoint. If we didn't do it this way, what would likely happen is, is that over probably a five or eight year period, we'd slowly try and chip away at putting curb gutter and sidewalk through uh, housing and urban development funds from the federal government um, as one of the eligible sources, or we'd try and do it through our annual you know, streets repaving process. But it, it's, it's a very protracted um, uh, catch up on infrastructure and our annexation areas as we can try and, again, chip away at it with some of our other funding sources. But this would allow us to actually um, have a little bit of a tool to incentivize annexation, frankly, and then also get some of those annexed areas up to standard from an infrastructure standpoint quicker than, than we would otherwise. What type of area? Like you said, within the city. Yeah, so some examples. Um, uh, Harris Ranch was a recent annexation. that, and, and there's many areas of the metro that look like city, but they're not. And so most of the Northwest is actually not city. And I say most of the Northwest. Maybe that's an unfair characterization. But we could actually provide a, a city map that shows some of these annexation areas. Um, but, uh, for example, uh, the Casa Loma area that's in southeast um, it's connected to Ward 1. It's adjacent to Ward 1. It's, it's along, um, well, Casa Loma, and, um, and uh, there's elementary schools and, and shopping malls, and, or excuse me, shopping strips, and many residential, but it's actually a county area. And so we would look to incorporate those into the city, but there's large areas along Casa Loma that don't have sidewalks, don't have street lights. Um, some other large examples like Bell Terrace, most of the Bell Terrace area is actually not city, it's, it's county. Um, there's large pockets in uh, northwest, large pockets in um, the north area along um, uh, 99 actually uh, in the industrial areas. There are significant areas in southeast and south that all again kind of look like a suburban environment but they're actually not city jurisdiction. Is there a cost to the homeowners? For the annexation, there's not, typically. For the improvements? For the improvements, there's not. And so um, because typically these are already developed to an extent, there's so not a cost. So they're already on sewer? Uh, unfortunately, many of them are not. And so to connect to the sewer, we do have sewer connection fees. And oh. actually, we contemplated whether or not to try and create a fund that would incentivize people to connect to the sewer through this annexation fund, but it would put that dollar a lot higher. And so we didn't do that in this proposal. But that is something that many of these annexation areas to try and encourage folks to get onto our sewer system, they've got to pay a pretty big connection fee. Yes. Um, I was wondering, you know, some of the areas that have the little ranchettes and are you talking about those two? Because you know, so, some of those areas, it t typically we're not making a big push to try and go get all the ranchettes that are on the edges of town. But we do have areas that are now, we, we call them islands, uh, that are completely surrounded by city jurisdiction. There's, for example, there's a, there's a couple um, along Callaway uh, that are uh, due for annexation and one that's probably not going to be annexed, but... Um, but um, if, if they're completely within sort of a, a more suburban or urban environment and they're just completely surrounded, we do look to annex them, but we typically grandfather in their right to have animals on there and their right to keep it, you know, on less um, intense density use. But we do look to annex those. But the ones that are out on the fringes, that's not really our, you know, that's, that's still a rural edge of the city. We're okay with that. But these ones that are right in the heart of the metropolitan area. And, and to speak a little bit to why annexation, we have sh uh, sheriff's deputies that are pinging all across the metro because they're going to these different pockets when we have law enforcement BPD right across the street in the city side that's, that is the city. I would say similar for our parks and for our streets um, and street lighting. 
having a consistent community fabric throughout the metropolitan area not only helps, I think, with a sense of place, but it's way more efficient than having different service entities kind of bouncing around. And so we see opportunities to be much more effective as a metro if it's all city. And, you know, this is this will take place over, you know, five, ten, you know, year plus periods, all the annexation areas, but it does create a lot of efficiencies. What about their um, amount of years that they're grandfathered on a septic? I mean, it's, you can't just it's, go write a check. To no, it's, to it's, it's indefinite until they make a change. So if they were going to try and go and put a whole new septic tank in, they have to connect. But as long as the septic works, it's grandfathered. And then um, the pop-up, I keep seeing them advertised. But if they're in different locations all the time, I mean, I saw one. I, I, don't, I don't know why you wouldn't have... Uh, just those dumpsters there, I see you have a vehicle with a grappler on it to pick up things that are left out outside the dumpster. Um, <clears throat> the alleys, and then um, also you brought up the tires. And for instance, our homeless pick up bottles and cans and bring them in. And I, I, I see it a lot, the tires, and I know the recycling fee is very, very high. The city, when we pick up, you guys pick them up, we pay for the recycling fee. The, the solid waste division does. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want to try? Well, the pop-ups, I, I, I bounce around, but make something more permanent. Because I don't know what day. I heard about one. You can take some devices, but I can't remember where it, where it was. I don't know who to call, and I'm not going to spend the time to do it. So, but if you know, <clears throat> here's the location. There's right. five around the city. You don't need, I mean, you have... Dumpsters. They, they are designed to try and be convenient to dis different areas of the city, and that's why they pop up from time to time. It's a 147 square mile area that we've got to cover, and uh, with a specific uh, one location spot, the, the drivability to that spot is probably going to be a little bit too far out. That's why we try to pop them up in well, different areas. Well, not if you forget where it is. Kind of. M maybe consistency in the pop up location is. They're going to be more permanent. But on the um, tires, back to the homeless people, you know, looking to make extra money, of giving a fee of, say, $3 for them to bring them in and recycle. Hmm. Innovative approach. You have, you don't have people out digging around, workers' comp issues, digging tires out. You have a huge population that's going to go get 10 tires. We can or a certainly, couple in a cart, or go around in a pickup, and have a pretty good day's understood. income. Understood. Yeah, the concept is innovative as applied to tires, so it's something I think we can definitely look at. Yeah, other cities have actually been starting pilot programs to pay homeless for bags of trash, shopping mm -hmm. carts returned. So tires is another idea. We'll, we'll take a look. Any other comments? Committee member Coleman. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Strackhouse, is that how you're struck loose? Struck loose. I'm sorry. Thank you for your presentation. You're you're relatively new to the city, yes? I am. Yes. How long have you been here? Three months. Okay. <laughs> All right. Can you talk a little bit about what the met methodology was? Well, before I get to that, there seems to be a discrepancy between what was presented to us at the last meeting for what the Public Works Department was going to ask for. It was 13.2 million dollars and then what you just ran down was 16 million dollars uh, am i missing something thank you committee member and that was because um we lumped a few other items that weren't public works specific into that slide and greg was generous to help cover those for us but the public works number is still the same but if you look at some of those other pieces um and i'm trying to think to go back uh like the um, ADA advances, the annexation fund, those were things that were on a citywide basis, not specific to public works. All right, thank you. Now, what was the methodology for picking the ones that you do have for $13 million? I mean, there's a lot of things we can be doing. What, well, uh, many projects are continuation of, of where we come from, a design to a construction. And uh, for example, the street light program, uh, that is a phased approach to spread the cost out over multiple years. That's part of the methodology. 
Okay. I, I have friends that come downtown to, you know, go to dinner or whatever, and I frequently get calls about maintaining the things we've already done in the city. We've, uh, you know, we did the big Mill Creek project back in the early 2000s, and we've done other street improvements. And, uh, you know, if you drive down to, uh, well, I'm, I'm drawing a blank at the Mexican restaurant in the Mill Creek there. Uh, Mexicali. Mexicali, thank you. You know, there was all these planners put in there to have, uh, you know, to make it a beautiful streetscape. And, you know, people run into them, and nobody makes any effort to fix those, to uh, keep the plants up in those things. What, what, what kind of things are we doing to try to maintain the things that we are, all, all these investments that we are making? Sure. Part, part as my understanding is that part of the, the issue there was the, the historical challenges with the funding component of it to purchase to replace some of these damaged items. Another component was some of the things we purchased just weren't resilient or strong enough or durable enough to withstand some of the, the, the vandalism or, or, or the damage that they've sustained. So um, now we're getting on top of that. We are coming forward with uh, some additional streetlight purchases. The city Council just approved it last night, as well as some of the bollards in the Mill Creek specifically, uh, specific area. So uh, we are working, um, and, and the replacements will be much more resilient infrastructure. A couple of thoughts I would add, committee member, because these are great questions, and, and we get those calls all the time too. You know, why is it, you know, why is that planter brick, you know, just laying on the ground, you know, again, because it's happened for the fifth time. Uh, a couple of thoughts about just uh, maintenance. One, um, the Parks Master Plan update is actually taking a hard look at what is the appropriate staffing ratio to continue to take good care of all of our parks by acre and all of our streetscapes by linear mile. Um, because there are complaints that you know, it doesn't doesn't look as good as you know we think it ought to or we think it should, uh, but I think we've stretched ourselves a little bit thin over the years, and there's an opportunity to look from some objective data at you know what will it take. The question is not you know should we do it or not. It's what would it take to really maintain those well. I think also from a built environment standpoint, many of our parks that are built you know two or three decades ago. Um, at the time, we hadn't learned as much about um, some of the types of infrastructure to put in place um, as we have today. And so our newer parks actually take less time to maintain because we don't create some of those mowing strips that are like a nightmare to take care of, or we don't put in some of those shrubs that have to get trimmed back you know, every, every month versus the shrubs you can do every three or every six months. And so we're actually, uh, uh, we've, we have new planting pallets and even new design pallets, and especially in the downtown corridor, we did a downtown corridor study to put in the type of streetscapes that are going to be not quite as challenging to maintain. Those planters, just by the way, are, they're going to go away. Those are very difficult to maintain, but things that are more at street level and pedestrian level are more appealing as well as uh, much easier to maintain anyway. So I think good comments, but I, I, our, our built environment, um, we're going to be changing it uh, along the way as you know deferred maintenance and, and maintenance occurs, but also as we're moving forward, we're, we're putting things in that are a, a lot easier to maintain. Really quickly, back to your question about how do we choose some of these projects, uh, I just want to also, one of the reasons we shared in our, our March meeting with the committee the context of the whole budget and this, particularly the streets funding. And we have $20 million every year that goes towards different streets projects. And, and a lot of that is street improvements, street paving and, and so forth. And we do have a rational way of looking at why we pick which streets to pave. We have a, what's called a pavement management system. There's a pavement condition index and there's scores on what's the, um, condition of each roadway and we look at the roadways and say which are the ones that um, if we do a little bit of work can get a lot more life and keep them in fair condition and those that are in really bad condition we need to go through and rebuild and so we, we are uh, looking um, across the board at all the areas of the city based on need but we also there sometimes we take advantage of opportunities where you know Caltrans is in the area or the counties in the area and we we 
um, align some of our projects, but otherwise it's based on the life of those streets or the condition of those streets. If you want to add anything on that, Greg, feel no, free. Hit that perfectly. Thank you. Uh, I would say that I think somebody is putting the thumb on their scale, on the scale on that because you know we all drive around town. And you got roads that are not getting renovated, and other roads get renovated every few years. So somebody's putting their thumb on the scale at some point, and so uh, I, I'm, I, I'm I'm happy to see that you are uh, addressing that. Uh, you know, going forward, I know that you know you have a new director and and, and are working out those kind of things. So I appreciate that you're aware of it and, and I, I look forward to changes in that regard. I, I have no more questions. Thank you. Vice Chair Abernathy. Right. I've been waiting to get to streets <laughs> and uh, because I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest issues in this town is how poor the quality is. And the same potholes I see year after year on California, on Stockdale, on Brim Hall, everywhere in this town, and they don't get fixed. Or <clears throat> when you complain enough, you get this thing where they do a short-term patch, whatever you want to call it. Well, eight months later, it's right the way it was. So why even do the short-term, in my opinion? Uh, so when you get this money from the sales tax, which is unique, and maybe one time in the way the economy's going, people may stop buying the things that give you the sales tax. Rather my opinion, than hiring people who are going to be here 30 years and the next guy 30 years and the pension and the health benefits is where's the money into the proving, you know, the quality of life in this town and to sell it to a new business is, is how our streets look. And they look pretty bad. I mean, every day to pull off a of California onto the street I'm on is a potholes, three potholes. Nobody ever fixes it, ever. Uh, and I'm thinking, who drives, where are the city workers who check this out? So I'd just like to say, when I look at this proposal, it's landscape, it's traffic calming, which is a fancy word for speed bumps, but um, it's not things that are gonna make the traffic move smooth and make our place look good. I'm less interested in how the median looks, particularly with all the homeless standing on them, than I am on fixing the roads. And there's a lot of them that have not been improved in decade, I would say, that are heavily traveled, by taxpayers and working people every day, and I just think I don't see the money in this whole thing for that. The, the, the good news is that, as Mr. Clegg mentioned, over $20 million is being invested by city taxpayers into the street resurfacing program this upcoming fiscal year. Now, we're looking at innovative ways to, to make that dollar spread out a lot more than what it has in the past. So, um, and what I mean by that is different design methods or pavement resurfacing methods that are intended to bring up our pavement condition index up higher, faster. Um, so, so we're working with more money in an accelerated way to cover more area. Well, what they did from like Brimhall, just from um, Gosford or Coffee to Callaway, they did something like that. And I don't think it lasted five months. And so I hope whatever you're using is better quality because I'll find out which way that this was. This short term thing does in my book doesn't work. So. Yeah, but I, I don't see much of the, of this proposal. Am I missing something here? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think you're missing anything, but I would I would just point to a few things. So um, the grant match fund, the three million dollars, a lot of that's gonna look like pavement. A lot of that's gonna be asphalt. I think when you look at the $3.75 million under the downtown corridor enhancements, that does include bike lanes. It includes some, some median work, but a lot of that is pavement. You know, To get those two streets, we, we knew needed a significant upgrade. Um, I would also uh, suggest that some of the gateway beautification pieces um, and traffic calming will have you know, real you know, impacts on, on pavement. Some of the reasons that there are other sort of a mix of other smaller elements in this request is because we've heard from a lot of folks about too much speeding and how do we slow things down and while that amount for traffic calming is not going to have the level of impact that's going to satisfy every phone caller that it starts to get at some of the areas where we haven't been able to get at but have been high demand areas same as with the medians. You know, we've got a lot of interest in taking those blacktop medians and, and converting those for, for look and feel, and that was, frankly, a, a specific um, council request uh, to include in the budget. So with the $20 million that's going into street repaving from other sources, maximizing the PSVS to get at 
the the special projects and the things that will have a big return on investment. Even though I do see I do see pavement in here, but not nearly as much as the other funding sources from the city. But that was, you know, a conscious choice to leverage those good funds and and um, get at some of the the highest ask areas that we have heard about over this past year around infrastructure. Um, in addition to the paving that's happening from the other funding sources. Well, I could suggest a quarter million for street improvement at the homeless center. <laughs> it just seems to me like, wow, that, that's, that's the top criteria. I just, maybe that quarter million could be on a street that's you know, heavily well, impacted by us trying to bring new business into town. Without cutting you off, I, I wanted to piggyback on that because uh, I did have a note in here that I thought that that was allocated in when the council originally agreed to do that. that, that oh, that's whole, a picture. I'm that, sorry. Yeah, that's that whole picture. segment of segment section two of this PowerPoint was reporting on former allocations yeah. and the outcomes. I misread, I misread Correct. that. Correct. Yeah. Right. I yeah. misread it but in general, I think the busy business areas, if a big part of this, to try to get your, you know, I'm into how elections work. Since 49.9% .9 of the voters didn't want this tax, why don't we do the things that help more of the people of the community see the benefit. That's, and and we'll, take, we'll take the, um, the comments about where repaving can have a big impact as good feedback. I, um, part of the reason for the shelters specifically was that that was, um, that was uh, an effort to demonstrate goodwill in which the communities in which those were being placed, that there was some you know, uh, advantage uh, and benefit. But I would also just respectfully suggest that as we build this PSVS budget, it's always from what we're hearing from the council, the community, and this committee, and trying to balance the many competing interests. Because I know a lot of people want better streets, but a lot of people are asking for traffic calming at the same time, and we try and balance those out um, and, and ultimately represent what we're hearing. But I think fair feedback on where the repaving can have a big impact. So I'll just, not to start a issue with my colleagues, I will say that I do support the $260,000 around the Navigation Center, not just because it was a make good, because we, we put that in the neighborhood. That is a heavy industrial corridor. There are businesses there that haul a lot of material. There are heavy trucks there. And as a representative of business, I think that ensuring that we have infrastructure that allows commerce to happen is incredibly important. Um, I would second and I would actually encourage the city to kind of look at committee member Madeline's suggestion around tires a little more broadly. I mean, are there other bulky items that we're not getting to that we could put in place some type of incentive programming into um, trying to, to, to stem this? I, I've made no secret that I'm a big fan of the um, of the Clean Cities Initiative. I'm a big fan of the pop-up events. I do believe you should keep moving around the city so that every neighborhood has equitable access. But that's just my opinion. Um, but I think that that's really, really a good thing. And I think it has helped in terms of trying to get some of the bulky items off of just being dumped into um, open lots or canals or other places. But I really did like committee member Madeline's suggestion around tires and thought maybe we could, we could expand on that. Any other comments, questions? Committee Member Mamlet. Can we take a million dollars and <laughs> see if we can teach people how to properly do a road? Because we keep spending and spending and spending. Um, there's no accountability. Um, it, the patching doesn't work. But even when they put new, complete from base on up, they don't hold up. And we do not, I mean, states all over the country have great roads, but they've got snow, they've got ice, they've got rain. So, so and their roads are great, but there's no accountability and it's a waste of money, I think, you know, other than finding the guy from 91 that did that road. I'm telling, that's the answer. But these either, these mixes aren't right or their prep's not right, but you, you have all these people and all that money and it, it, it's not fixed, it's not fixed properly, and there's no longevity. So let, let me take that up a couple of ways. <clears throat> well, I know we're not gonna go have a training session with road workers, but. Well, actually, we, <laughs> we, we would invite committee members to, in areas of interest, to reach out to me 
and have opportunities to go and meet with our staff so that you can have a window into how we do the work that we do and appreciate that. I think um, I would respectfully suggest that, you know, in this context and you know from the dais you know is, is not the best way to manage our, our road system but we're happy to provide a window into how we do the work that we do but let me answer the question from a couple of broad perspectives number one i hope this doesn't sound harsh but frankly city of bakersfield residents have not been willing to invest in this community historically and that's why our roads are in bad shape and measure n passage was a huge move forward to say we're willing to spend on the things we care a lot about which number one was public safety homelessness has become a real close number two and we hear that uh, parks and, and streets are a really big importance as well our road system has been under invested in for decades and it takes a long time to catch up and so our our staff have done i think the best that they can to keep things updated but I would also reflect that we've, we actually have a new street superintendent who comes from the private sector. Over the last two years, Greg, he's been with the city and he's brought a lot of new ideas and he's recognized that some of the practices that we were doing maybe for the last decade weren't the best practices. And actually one of the things that, that, um, that is critical, and I, I won't try and spend too much time on this again because it's a, a little bit outside of our scope for today, but um, one of the common mistakes in road repair is you go to the worst road and you try and fix it up. When, but then that lets all of your roads in fair condition deteriorate and so you never catch up. And so you actually have to spend some money on those that are in fair condition to keep them up while you're going and chipping away at all the ones that are in bad condition, especially when you're in catch up mode like City of Bakersfield is in catch up mode. I would just suggest to the committee, we do have very professional staff. They know what they're doing and there are very common best practice standards uh, in this industry. And we're deploying those best practice standards, both our street superintendent, our new public works director, they know what they're doing on this topic. We simply have a lot of catch up work to do. We've got decades of catch up on our roads to do. And we're actually putting more of our local street monies um, into repaving than we have historically. And so we're gonna catch up, but it's gonna take some time to do that. Um, I, I, uh, I do think um, that they use their best expertise and judgment to weigh out when we do a temporary and when we do a full rebuild. And there are all good industry uh, best practice standards on those. And you know, we invite those that are interested in that process. We'll set you up an appointment to go with Greg out there and do some site visits. Sure. And if I I'll could just add to that. I'll some asphalt. <laughs> if I could just add to that. The right-of-way corridor does serve... A for the roads, but there are many, many utilities that are under those roads. And the automobiles and trucks that travel on top of that road uh, sometimes don't always travel on top well. And, and there are crashes that damage the, the asphalt. There are water main breaks that occur. There are a lot of challenges to, to maintaining that pavement system over the course of its intended life. Um, but there are new innovative ways by which to put place pace, pavement down uh, to help it to last longer and be more resilient. But the new road projects aren't holding up. Even 90, I wasn't talking about the city or county, I'm, I'm including Caltrans and everyone. Uh, the patches certainly don't work. And you can have a Walmart truck with thousands, I know they're not going at speed, but they've got trucks rolling in and out all day long. And they hold up for, I don't know how many years. And the, the, these new roads, or the rebuilds, as you call them, are not holding up. Not holding up at all. And then even the 99 project, I'm, once they pull the barricades, I'm waiting to see how well that holds up. Okay. Because gonna, even driving now, it is... Just for time purposes, I'm going to... I apologize. I okay. hate to interrupt my colleagues, but I feel like we're a little afield. So I'm going to go to uh, Vice Chair Abernathy. I just want to have you clarify what you just said. You said Bakersfield hasn't been willing to invest. So we're all paying our taxes and doing all the things that we can do. What, we did, what did we do wrong? I think Measure N was long overdue, and we should have raised taxes before we did three years ago. But why are we spent, you know, why isn't more money being spent on the roads than, than some of this? I mean, I, you have a tough job, but it's just, I guess I was brought here to 
Oh, yeah, that you're, throw you're, things against the wall. Sure, and yeah, you're doing your job. That's okay. Maybe not be popular at times. No, that's okay. Uh, again, I, I think I've commented on that. It's a balancing act between the many uh, competing demands that we have, and because we're able to put those $20 million to streets from other sources, that we've prioritized these proposals in this way. The, the um, resurfacing, the tw $20 million worth of resurfacing that we're about to do will cause construction disruption throughout the community. There will be traffic jams and, and detours and lane narrowing. Um, so we want to kind of pace that as well. Uh, a fair point, Greg. And actually, one, one other thought, just again, don't want to be too far afield. Um, there, were, there are many of our local collectors and arterials that we have chosen not to redo until the trip pro program is complete because the trip program is going to take a lot of the traffic off of our main arterials and collectors and put it onto highways. But if we go and fix those collectors and arterials today, they're going to get tore up again because we've got a lot of truck traffic and heavy uh, traffic on our arterials because they can't use the highways like they will after trip is done. So we've actually contemplated what if, let, let me throw a crazy idea out there, what if we spent $100 million and bonded to do a bunch of street projects? Well. We can't, we can't do it all at once. You have to pace this out because of the disruptions of construction, as well as we need to get trip complete before we work on some of our roadways. All right. I think we are good to move on. Thank you. If you don't mind, Greg, I'll take the clicker. Thank you. We are complete with our presentations. Committee members, thank you. And we're at the point where uh, we are going to tee up um, the proposals uh, for um, motion or, or direction by the committee. Again, as a reminder, um, the, 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 there, uh, as I mentioned, there's three key purposes of the committee. Um, and uh, we've fulfilled uh, actually two of those today in providing advice and ideas about how to spend, as well as just comments and feedback about the proposals. And then the third is, the accountability perspective of assuring that the proposed uh, budget items are consistent with the, th the 13 priorities. And again, I think there's been you know, some conversation about how do we prioritize, how do you best spend the dollars? Uh, I would respectfully um, suggest to the committee that that's not the vote that's being taken. The vote that's being taken is, are these consistent with the 13 that we shouldn't be spending on something that's so far afield that it's not within the 13 priorities? So, um, oh, excuse me, fiscal solvency, we missed, good grief. Um, there is one more piece, I'm sorry. Um, really quickly, on the one-time side, this first item, model of excellence, this is to basically create an internal audit program that helps us to become much more efficient and measure and perform based on performance metrics and data analysis. Grant writing, that's just to leverage these dollars to get more dollars outside of the city. The market compensation adjustment set aside is the same as we did at mid-year. Um, I know uh, committee member Madeline wasn't with, wasn't with us at mid-year, but this is, we, we anticipate some of our costs going up uh, around personnel, and this is to stay ahead of those costs. Lastly, very small allocations, but we think with a big impact to uh, help our employees have better skill sets around customer service and community engagement. And then because we're hiring some new positions, there's just going to be some costs to those employment exams and supplies for those, and that's what hits fiscal solvency. I think I'll move forward there, and unless there's questions on those as we take up items, we'll go at that. Uh, committee Member Perez Andreessen. Sure. Just quick question on the model of excellence program. You said that's an internal audit. Correct. So you're going to set up an internal audit department? Not, not exactly. So I'm glad you, you asked for that clarification. It, it, we're not trying to create a city auditor or an audit department. This is going to be by contract. So contract. we've actually okay. put an RFP out to ask uh, audit firms who have experience in particular with municipal performance base because it's not, we're not talking about financial audits. We're talking about performance audits and and internal control reviews. And so uh, we would contract this out. It's uh, much more cost effective that way. And then for the grant writing line item, I think you are asking for $150,000. What does that include? It is all contract work as well. It will okay. basically allow us to do contracts with two grant writing firms. Okay. And it's actually on a per, um, 
grant basis. So if we don't ask them to write us a grant, we don't spend that money. But if they write a grant for us, and it's usually in a, typically roughly in a, like a five, ten, fifteen thousand dollar increment. Really big grants, it's a little more. Smaller grants, it's about five thousand dollars. So that would give us the opportunity to apply for you know dozens of grants. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of questions on comp and class. So. Um, in the write-up, it says, it is not anticipated that this funding allocation would address all anticipated compensation adjustment. So what is the plan if that compensation adjustment goes beyond the $2 million? Is it that the general fund would absorb that or that there would be a request back to the PSVS committee? Thank you, Chair. Another great question. Um, it is anticipated that that data will come in a cycle that we'll probably have an opportunity to look at mid-year or even next year. Um, uh, we expect that both that class and comp is going to hit all employees across the city. So those that are funded by enterprise funds would be covered through their enterprise fund. But employees that are in the general fund or PSVS, that the funds for class and comp will come from general fund and PSVS and the mix of that, you know, it, it may be an, um, an interesting conversation in the future of how we, how we fund that. Um, but uh, it's really just a heads up that we don't have the number and so we just don't want people to feel like we've promised that that's going to get us there. And so we'll come back to both this committee and city council to really determine how we pay for those costs once we have the real numbers, but we think this is a great start at staying ahead of it. Yep. And then I would just on community engagement support, I mean, I think this is a good idea. I hope that it's more than like a listserv. I mean, I, I can think of and name off the top of my head probably four or five city initiatives, and that probably doesn't even begin to capture all of them, where there's active community engagement, stakeholder engagement going on. And so if there's a way to kind of centralize that, I think that that would be very, very effective. I appreciate the feedback. This is to actually build a centralized toolkit through the city manager's office to have a standardized approach to community engagement as well as some of the actual tools to do it and training of for employees. Colleagues? Committee member Prince? Yes. Um, it, this is basically a question in regards to the, um, the budget itself. Um, three years ago, we were looking at a, uh, an estimated uh, co collection for Measure N of, of around $60 million. Now we're at about, uh, let's say, roughly 100 million. So that's roughly a 80% say increase, okay, based on those numbers. It could be off a percentage or two, but um, um, my question is the general budget as well, because this is a 1% added income tax. So is the general budget also seeing a increase similarly as Measure N based upon those same numbers? It is not. And um, if, if um, Randy McKeegan wants to speak to specific numbers, we could probably get to that. But uh, there's, there's a couple of factors that impact why the general fund is not increasing as much, although the general fund has increased over the last three years with a dip, of course, during the pandemic. Um, on the general fund side, we have a much longer history, and on the PSVS side, we had very little history, and so we weren't sure what was going to come in. And so, you know, we, we conservatively estimated that $60 million, but first year collections were closer to $80 million. And so the, the percent increase has not been uh, as big on the actual side, although it has been significant. Another factor is, is that uh, this is a sales and use tax, and so we actually get more for the 1% of PSVS than we do for the 1% of Bradley Burns. We actually get more revenues on the same 1% because it also is sales and use, and there are certain things that get 1%ed in under PSVS that don't under Bradley Burns. Um, but but the, the general fund side has increased if you look at the employee balance between PSVS and the general fund, many more employees in the general fund. And so some of our, like on the policing side, we had a 4% uh, COLA negotiated with our police union. PSVS positions take a piece of that, but there's a much bigger portion of the general fund that takes up those increases in costs. And so the general fund does have a little bit of uh, you know, room in this coming year 
um, but the general fund has been fully allocated for you know decades, and the incremental cost of just uh, you know with as noted earlier the CPI being up eight percent, with a five percent increase to the operating costs of all of our departments in the general fund, it takes up most of that increase that's happened on the general fund side. So there's still very little space in the general fund for other positions and other programs. Uh, and I, I don't want to get ahead of city council because they haven't heard that number even themselves for this year, but it's it's a pretty small number of what the new amount is available in the general fund, although we will be able to do a handful of support positions from you know departments like human resources and finance, and we didn't bring those forward to PSVS because they're more appropriately suited to the general fund, but we're not seeing big increases on the general fund side. Vice Chair Abernathy. Uh, overall, with all these new employees, uh, what changes have been made, if any, to the retirement pension program of the city employees to get away from defined benefit? Because we can't afford that. No changes have been made. That's, uh, I think, um, a long conversation. Uh, as a CalPERS uh, system member, we're not really able to make changes to our system that are really significant outside of the, you know, the CalPERS entire system changing. I'll just give some context too, because I come from Stockton, and Stockton went through bankruptcy and was looking really hard at, should we reduce our pensions, because they are very expensive, should we just offer a much lower pension than any, any other city, because we're going through bankruptcy and we have a chance to actually change our deal with CalPERS. Otherwise, you know, we, we don't really have an ability to change our deal with CalPERS outside of a process like bankruptcy. We made a business decision in Stockton that we couldn't lower our um, CalPERS agreement lower than every other city in the state because we would immediately be almost unable to hire and recruit employees because they'd go to the next city next door because they'd have a much different benefit. I think pension reform needs to occur at the state level. Uh, we, we actually are, are the beneficiaries of one state reform, but it wasn't enough. If you ask me my opinion on pension reform at the state level, what was done in 2013 was not enough. We probably still need additional pension reform. And in that same time frame, the city took action to um, uh, eliminate future employees getting uh, act or entering into our retiree medical um, program. Uh, and so that's a closed system. New employees don't get access to the retiree medical program. And we also uh, have other pension benefits that were closed as of 2013. That any, there are some employees that have been here since before 2013 that are eligible for certain benefits um, uh, that are now closed systems, several of those. So we've, done, we've made those efforts to reduce our overall pension costs, but the base pension with CalPERS we haven't changed, and our competitive advantage would be we would be at a significant disadvantage um, you know, in hiring police and other employees. Well, <clears throat> the pension program of the city employees and the county in this area is so fabulous compared to the private sector. If your employees are all going to leave, my employees will take the jobs. I mean, I, nobody's going to run away from a retirement system as generous as the city has. So I, I would think that if we don't make that, we're fooling ourselves that we have money for any of these employees and their subsequent rehires when they retire. Uh, this is a, something we've got to change. And if filing bankruptcy is a way to get there, that's fine too because we're, we can't pay this, as you know. But that's... That's my final. Uh, just, just really quickly, I, I, I'll take some of the elements of those comments as feedback, but would reflect that we have built a 20-year financial forecasting tool that tells us about our expected costs and revenues over a 20-year period for the general fund and for PSVS. And we, every staffing decision, we plug into that model to say, can we pay for this in 20 years? And I say with confidence that everything we've proposed, we can pay for in the next 20 years. Um, there, over the next 10 years, the pension costs are a huge portion of increases in our budgets on the general fund side. Um, but we, I am confident we can um, afford those costs, but we do have to be very thoughtful about the size of uh, staffing because of that. And, and you'd be surprised at how little of a change compounded over 20 years can impact our revenue projections into the future. 
Committee Member Madland. A 20 year forecast. Um, in the United States or here, anywhere, forecasting right now is basically impossible. I mean, you cannot forecast, and then you have um, people leaving the state, they get their retirement and pension, and they're, they're out of here. I mean, invest in U hauls. That's the investment right now. But I mean, the money's not staying here. And how can you, you can't forecast? How long do you think not use the forecast before the city or county is, is bankrupt? Say the last part of your question again. How long before? Yeah. If you're forecasting, I mean, if you're not taking into consideration the negative of what's happening because people leave the state because of everything. The, the forecast is very comprehensive. It's very mm -hmm. sophisticated. It's based on many decades of history. And um, while it is difficult to forecast right now, I don't think it's impossible. It actually anticipates seven-year recessions in the forecast because, you know, if you look at historical data, that's very common. Um, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm confident in, in our forecast. And we know there's challenges ahead of us economically, but we're, you know, making lots of movements around diversifying the economy of um, Bakersfield. Um, and uh, again, I would just suggest that uh, our, our forecasting tool is a very valuable tool. And, and with that, and, and in light of our time, I'm um, happy to answer you know, any final questions on the fiscal solvency, but ready to sort of tee up our, our proposals. Well, I just have, you know, I would say if you're Arizona, Nevada, Texas, you could forecast. But California, we're very unique in that people are leaving here. They are not moving in. I know housing. I, I can't find people to move here to go to work. I know that. Um, it's just something that bothers me a little bit. And then on the road, the road issue, bouncing back to that, do the distribution centers and other companies like that pay road tax? They, Amazon's, they, they, Walmart's. They do in a couple of different ways, but I would say, um, I mean, on an ongoing basis, it's mostly you know paid through. Um, by their, um, you know, gasoline or, or, or other taxes. But up front, when uh, a facility comes in that we know is going to have a heavy road use, they are required through development fees to put in um, significant investments in the road infrastructure. I forgot what I was going to say. Lucky you. Thank you, committee members. So um, again, this is, this is a reminder, these are the 13 community priorities. We're looking at $45 million in proposals. Uh, on the one, or excuse me, on the ongoing side, again, it's a, a little less than 8 million, but half of that is truly ongoing. The other half is um, one-time uh, sort of startup costs. And so the way that, uh, and, and just really quickly, I'm gonna run over this really fast is that to give you some perspective about where the employee costs have gone historically. This year, we're not asking for very many employees because we're winding that down. And as you see there, significant investments in police, fire, our code enforcement, rapid response, uh, and parks, other areas, um, less investment. And this is a makeup of total personnel. Again, you'll see there, public safety, very heavy. You see bigger blocks in parks and development services and again, economic development because we didn't have a department prior. This year's requests are reflected here in summary in the pie chart. Again, significant increases, even though city manager office positions are within public safety. Um, so between um, that, police and fire, largely public safety and a bit of code enforcement. So we've teed these up for your consideration in the same summary slides that we presented early on. And we've teed it up in the council goals. And so this first one actually has two slides because public safety is bigger than the rest. It actually takes up two slides. All others are gonna be a one slide. And for the benefit of the committee members, typically um, as this has been done historically, uh, we've taken it in chunks. If, if a committee member would like to I try and um, you know parse out a specific item for consideration that can be done, but typically it would be a motion from a committee member 
to find that the public safety items are consistent with the the uh, 13, you know, one of the 13, you know, priorities as just an example or a sample. And so we'll tee these up one slide at a time for committee consideration. Yes. Interrupter. Yeah. <laughs> So you're going to ask for a motion on each one of these slides going forward from here? Correct. Okay. All right. So what, what, what I, I would like to see is some discussion uh, with this committee, uh, maybe in, in general about this budget and, and not have to go right to either approving or denying these things. I think there's a couple of of general issues that I think, personally, I think need to be talked about and from what other conversations I've had, uh, other people have questions about as well. So I, I, I would ask the, the, the chairman maybe to uh, just go down the row and uh, let each commissioner uh, comment where we're at at this point. I think we've heard the presentations, uh, we can see the numbers, but I think that it might be the, the time to have the uh, commissioners opine. Perfect. I will start with Commissioner Prince. Sorry to put you on the spot. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my approach may be a little different just based upon uh, the fact that my history on this um, committee, um, and I think I, I stressed this the, uh, during our first meeting, um, w why we're here. And this is in regards to, and City Manager Clegg actually um, has have stated that a few times today. What we have done in the past is the fact that we would look at each individual proposal and make a determination on whether or not that proposal met the guidelines in regards to measure in. Okay? And primarily, it was a up and down, yes or no determination in our own individual opinions. Then in turn, if there was something that we didn't agree upon that was a part of the budget that was being offered or a position or a particular item that we felt as if should not meet that criteria in regards to importance or whatever that reason may be, then we were... Uh, in a position to make a note in regards to that particular item to the city council. Because at the end of the day, it's the council who's going to make the determination regardless of what we say, yay or nay. What we're doing or what we did in the past was then we would um, make a uh, statement in regards to whether we either approve or disapprove in regards to an item that stood out. Um, so primarily that's what we did in the past. And I'm in a position to feel as if that's the best way to move them forward. If not, we would be here for days going through each individual item here that is listed. So. If I may as well, I just want to clarify something that Committee Member Prince stated. It has been our practice that if there are dissenting votes on an item that is moved forward, that we have reflected that the rationale and the reasons given by the committee member dissenting in our communication to city council so they're aware of those reasons. And so we did that last year. We did that actually at mid-year for the items that were brought up to this same group. And so confirming what Fred is saying is that, yes, if someone pro points out a specific item um, and, and a, 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 a feedback on it, we take note of that and include that in our record for the council. I'm going to continue going down with my colleagues. Um, Dr. Singh, committee member Singh. Uh, no, I am agreeing with whatever you say. That's fine. Thank you. Committee Member Coleman. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank you for the, the job your department, your staff has done. Uh, it, it was very thorough presentation over the last uh, two days. We've had a chance to look at this stuff. So uh, congratulations to, to you and your department. Uh, I, first of all, I'm going to trust that I, we really never had a chance to get to know each other until this committee. Uh, I'm going to trust that, you know, you're uh, doing your 
city manager thing and, and you're overseeing uh, some of the efficiency issues within your within the departments uh, but uh, uh, and I know we're only being asked to you know confirm whether these things fall within those 13 objectives uh, of the of the measure in but I wanted to get to this issue of you know, and you mentioned it, slowing down the hiring. We need to get over this lottery winner syndrome and uh, and focus on some of these uh, recurring costs because uh, I'm looking at the recurring costs, and this is from your slide, that this year, 60, out of the $113 million that we're getting, uh, $67.5 million of that is money it's already committed so i'm saying that's recurring cost you're going to incur another seven million almost eight million dollars uh this year which pushes it to about 75 million which is almost the entire amount of money you got in 2019 and so at, at some point we need to have some uh well we don't <laughs> we in my opinion <laughs> We, we need to have some, you know, check on that. And so I, I'd personally like to see us uh, have some, uh, some, and I know it's beyond our ability here as this commission, but certainly within the city council's uh, position to uh, maybe set some limitations. Because it's really nice to have the $45 million for, you know, various projects we like to do. You know, you guys spent $20 million last year on enterprise system, which there's no other way you'd ever been able to do that. And so we need to be able to have those lump sums of cash. But if we keep hacking away at it, keep adding recurring costs, uh, you know, at some point, maybe that we don't have that. So that's my, uh, that's my issue. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you. If, if I may just take a quick opportunity, because you made a great point again, and council at our April 6th presentation on the same budget asked for us to bring that topic to the Budget and Finance Committee to develop a policy that establishes sort of a, a, a percentage of the budget that would go towards ongoing and a percentage that would not. And this is something that this committee has recommended in the past, including I believe committee member Prince was the motion maker on that one. And well, we're at 60% now, so, yeah. Yeah, so. And so th that topic is coming forward for council to adopt a policy on that. Just really quickly, I would reflect for this group that in the recurring amounts, I, I might have mentioned this last time that we met, that there are personnel costs, and those are long-term costs. There are contract costs that are much more flexible. And then we actually have recurring one-time amounts. So we have $5 million that goes into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We have uh, $3 million that's been going into a community revitalization fund. And so there are, there's, and, and we're working actually on these numbers to share with the city council and we can follow up with this group as well. But there's a significant portion of that $67 million that's actually one-time monies. We just keep allocating them each year because they're priorities. But it, we do have the ability to back off some of those. But it, it's really important, I, I agree with you, to have a policy in place that makes sure we're preserving those one-time monies to get at big projects. Vice Chair Abernathy, any comments? Well, <clears throat> I agree we have to be sure that what we're doing, recommending, it fits the category, uh, as you said, Mr. Prince, about, you know, satisfying what, what the categories were that we're supposed to spend on, but it's how it's spent is also equally to me important. And with the siege against oil and ag that's going on in the state that's not going to stop until politics changes, uh, we have a real problem in, in this area, sustaining our economy, no matter how many you know, uh, distribution centers open. Those are not the caliber of jobs that are going to pay what we need to pay. So uh, to me, there needs to be radical change. There needs to be, you know, new hires aren't going to be in that, figure out another, you know, not defined benefit program, something else. And I think that that's really a serious issue. And I'd like to see more contracting out so we can fix some of these things you want fixed and then say thank you, goodbye, um, so that we don't have them sitting on our payroll and our health benefits for so long. So. Those are reasons why I have <clears throat> real concerns that until there's real change in how we're running 
and you, I know you can't do all of that in a year, but we've had three and a half years to look at how are we going to make sure we can sustain this because a little sales tax business is not going to keep it up compared to the payroll costs. So that's my concern is about the amount of payroll that we can't contract out, that somehow we can't change the pension system. We can't let go of people because no one will take the job. I think they're, they're great jobs at the pay. So those, those are my concerns over a lot of it. I know staff put together numbers all match and all that, but overall that's a serious concern I have. Thank you. Just since we're going in line, I'll recognize myself. I mean, I, I, I can understand and I can appreciate really everything that my colleagues have said. Um, I think I, I tend to agree with committee member Prince. I mean, we have a very specific and unique charge, which is to um, serve as the taxpayer's check that the money is being spent um, in a way that's consistent with the measure. This, this oversight committee, it's something as an advocate that I, I advocated for and, and, and definitely supported at the time. And it, we're unique in that we get two bites at the apple. In most communities that have a sales tax, um, the only time that the oversight body gets to vote is at the end after the money has already been spent. And in Kern County and Bakersfield, we have a unique system where we get two bites at the apple. We get uh, a chance to opine and comment and hopefully shape some of the proposals that are going to be moving through the count to the council and um, a chance at the end to say whether or not the money that was actually spent, not just budgeted, um, is consistent with the measure. Um, I, I do get concerned about mission creep. Um, we are charged with really one thing which is dealing with the oversight of this pot of funds. Um, other pots of funds and other funding sources play into the discussions that we're having around these proposals, but they're not our domain. And then the other, and I think the most important thing to, to keep in mind for all of us is that we are not the city council. There, there is one set of appropriators in our system of government locally, and that is the city council. And so, you know, we have a very, very simple job, but an opportunity through these presentations, which I think everyone on this council and this committee has taken um, a part in, to shape what the city will ultimately propose to the city council that has the ultimate responsibility through not only city charter, but their direct responsibility to the voters to be appropriating dollars and spending those dollars. Um, two things, you know, as in, you know, my organization, worked very hard to get measure in passed. We thought it was a, a moment in time that was very, very necessary. We had done so much polling of our members, of voters in Kern County, who felt and who continue to feel that the quality of life that we have enjoyed in this community is slipping away. And the only way, in my opinion, that we can change that, we can arrest not only that perception, but that reality is through making targeted investments and making sure that people feel their tax dollars. There is no mechanism to return this money to the taxpayer. The only mechanism that we have as a city is to try to program it and to make sure that it goes as strategically and efficiently as possible. I completely concur with my colleague, committee member Komen, and um, the prior efforts by committee member Prince around ongoing costs. I think the city, and this is something that we at the chamber have said for some time since measure and passed, since the day that the, you know, the, the registrar of voters updated the vote count and you saw, you know, how, how slim a majority it had, which is that the city needs a goal, needs a policy threshold around ongoing costs. And from my perspective, that's specific to staff costs. We are getting to the point, um, and I think you've, you, you mentioned this, uh, Mr. Clegg, that you know, we're, we're getting to the point where we're, we're nearly 100% programmed, and we need to maintain the room to make some of these targeted, strategic, smart investments down the road for other councils, other bodies like our own to opine on. So those are my, my comments, and uh, appreciate the indulgence of my colleagues there, and I will um, move now to Councilmember Perez Andreessen. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank um, the city manager and the staff for all the hours that you put in to put all these presentations together and taking the time to go through all of them with the committee. Um, I'm okay with following the same pro process we have in the past few years where we vote on each of the sections and if we don't agree with a specific line item, we voice that concern and then that's forwarded to the city council. 
Thank you. Committee Member Madland. Well, I just, I don't even know where to start. I mean, the pay is really pretty high, the benefits. I mean, like Kathy said, I mean, they're not going away. Um, doing more subcontracting on some of these items. I mean, are you not going to generate more tax revenue and employ more people? Um, and then I looked at one pro project what I know, that I know a little bit about, and basically it was um, three times more than what I'd found quoted. Now, even if you take into account a 10 or 20% cost of product and labor, it's so far off, and that concerns me, then that's, that's one thing I looked at. Only one. And usually when I, you know, at work I find one, it's like, uh-oh, don't start digging. Um, but it's just, I don't, I just think we need to, you know, everybody has a little bit of input. And I'd feel more comfortable just with a, you know, nothing long or arduous meeting, but to throw some ideas around. It's a lot of money, and as you brought up, it's, it's, it's not going to our top four items that are crisis here. You know, homeless, crime, fire, and I'll make up another one. I don't know what that one is, but um, that's, I'm just uncomfortable because that one item was off millions. I mean, not millions. I can't add, but I'll show it to you if you'd like. Is this again related to the trucks? No. Okay. The shelving. Do you, I'll just tell you what it is right now. The shelving in the evidence department, number one, you probably need to enlarge the, the footprint, but it's um, 1,700 square foot, 15 foot ceiling. Um, I know of a company that did one uh, in Los Angeles where the permits are higher. When they did it a year, year and a half ago, it was $250 a square foot. So that comes up to, you know, four and a half million. I mean, what is it? It's not one, it's 1 1.75. I didn't go to school much, but school of hard knocks. Uh, but 450,000 versus 1.75 million in, it, in a room that doesn't give you any place to go. If you're going to point, put, do 1.75, I mean, this is just the one item. So it makes me think what else is in here that could have a, just needs to be, give us a few minutes to run it around. And uh, just a couple thoughts uh, for the committee. And again, it's, it's the will of the committee, but uh, I would suggest uh, a couple of things. Um, and, and I appreciate too, can we Committee Member Madeline, that you've come in, you know, midstream, and it's very tough to to ramp up on on some of the content. Um, as we prepare our budget information, you know, just, just to give a perspective on how the how city does procurement, for example, I mean, we put this stuff out to bid. If it's not a straight bid, it's a request for proposals, and so it's always market tested. And it's based on what we've experienced in the market and what we've researched in the market as to you know what those costs are going to be. Uh, sometimes because of you know state requirements, uh, sometimes even our own municipal code requirements, it does edge our prices up a little higher than sometimes can be done in the pr uh, private sector. But it is always market based, and so the, I think the good news is, is if we were to go to market and got somebody to come in at a much lower bid, we've saved, and that savings comes back to one time monies that this committee gets to make recommendations on at mid year. Once you know we realize we've achieved those savings, so uh, you know I, I uh, appreciate again the, the feedback and the pieces of in, of information. I think the areas of particular interest again, we're happy to create windows into those specific areas of your interest as committee members so you can see how staff approaches this work. But I am confident in the numbers that staff has prepared based on their research and the market comparisons. And again, if we can go to market and get better deals, we're all winners. If you're off, off that much money, where does the rest of the money go then? 
I mean, goes, that's, that's a big discrepancy. It goes into fund balance. It can't get spent on something else. It goes into fund balance that comes back for reallocation by the council and the committee. All right. Thank you. So as we think through these, we have um, our... Um, we have these pages in our packet. So this is what I'm, what I'm kind of using and referring to. We have um, the ongoing yes, dollars. There, if I may, Chair, yeah. if it can help. Yes. There, there are there are four mm -hmm. there are four buckets of ongoing, mm -hmm. and then I believe there's six buckets of one time. And we had proposed taking each of those, you know, separately. Okay. And again, it's it's pretty much one slide per, except mm -hmm. for this first one that is the ongoing uh, related to public safety because of the number of you know police positions in there, it's over two slides. So it represents a $4 million um, ongoing related to public safety is the, sort of the first one for consideration. Okay. So going to my colleagues for the ongoing expenditures to public safety services, which um, encompasses slides 64 and 65 in the packet on page 32 of our printed packet. The total is 4.335 million. Um, is there a motion? Yes, sir. I make a motion. I second. Okay. So just to clarify, motion by committee member Singh, second by Vice Chair Abernathy, that these expenses are consistent with the measure. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? And that, and that you recommend um, forwarding to council? Yes, yeah, sending forwarding to city council for approval. Okay. So. Motion by committee member Singh and second by Vice Chair Abernathy that we find that these um, uh, expenses are consistent with the measure and we recommend to City Council for approval. All right. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz. Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy. Aye. Committee member Madeline. Aye. Committee member Dewey is absent. Committee member Perez and Dreesen. Aye. Committee member Keller is also absent. Committee member Komen. Aye. Committee member Singh. Aye. Committee member Prince. Yes. Motion is approved with committee members Dewey and Keller absent. Right. The ongoing amount for our Council goal two around homelessness is just this one number around the operating costs for the contract with Mercy House. All right. Looking for any? I'll make a motion to approve uh, this item regarding the contract lease with Mercy Housing and recommend to City Council to adopt. All right. I'll second. All right. Motion yes. by Committee Member Coleman. Second by committee member Perez Andreessen to um, find that this <laughs> find that this expense is consistent with the measure and recommend approval to city council. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz. Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy. Aye. Committee member Madeline. Aye. Committee member Dewey is absent. Committee member Perez Andreessen. Aye. Keller is also absent. Committee member Komen? Aye. Committee, committee member Singh? Aye. Committee member Prince? Yes. Motion is approved with committee members Dewey and Keller absent. Awesome. For fiscal solvency, this is the smallest one you'll see. It's actually a reclassification, but we wanted to be transparent. It's not a new position, but we had, uh, this is one that we found that the level of responsibility to help um, with all of the accounting uh, additional work uh, with the increase in policing staff requires a higher level role. And so um, this one position has already been approved under PSVS, but this would increase the salary of that, or the, actually it's the salary and total benefits of that um, position by this amount. 
Looking for action from my colleagues. I'll make the motion. Okay, motion by Pre uh, committee member Perez Andreessen. Is there a second? Yes. Okay, um, motion by committee member Perez Andreessen, um, second by committee member Singh to find that um, the finance department accounting clerk reclass is consistent with the measure and recommend approval to the city council. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz. Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy. Aye. Committee member Madlin. Aye. Committee member Dewey's absent. Committee member Perez and Dreesen. Aye. Committee member Keller is absent. Committee member Komen. Aye. Committee member Singh. Aye. Committee member Prince. Yes. Motion is approved with committee members Dewey and Keller absent. Great. Quality of life for ongoing, uh, just as again a, a quick reminder, it's principally code enforcement, one planner, and our clean city teams expansion and pop-up event expansion. Awesome. All right, turning to my colleagues for action. I'd like to uh, make a motion in regards to uh, this particular item and stating the fact that it is consistent with the priorities um, of the measure and should be forwarded to the city council. Motion by committee member Prince. Is there a second? I'll second that. Motion by committee member Prince, second by committee member Komen. I will dispense with reading the whole thing if council is okay with that. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? <laughs> Chair Ortiz. Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy? No. Committee Member Madlin? No. Committee Member Dewey is absent. Committee Member Prez and Dreesen? Aye. Committee Member Keller is absent. Committee Member Komen? Aye. Committee Member Singh? Aye. Committee Member Prince? Yes. Motion is approved with uh, Vice Chair Abernathy and Committee Ma Member Madeline voting no, and Committee Members Dewey and Keller absent. All right. Now on to one time. One time. Um, this is again the much larger chunk here, but we've broken it into these areas. On the public safety side, again, um, many much of this is actually police. Um, facility improvements, the fire apparatus is a notable item, some for uh, rapid response teams as well as uh, video security. Mr. Chair, if I may, before we vote on this, yes. um, just want to make a, a note of the fact that in previous years when there was a nay or no vote yeah. on any of these oh, yes. items that um, those members were allowed to uh, make a statement about their vote if they wanted it for the record to be passed on to the city council as well. Thank you, committee member Prince, appreciate that. And yes, um, Vice Chair Abernathy, do you have any statement to make around your no vote? Okay. Committee member Madland, anything you wanted included in the record regarding the rationale for your no vote on the last vote? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Committee Member Prince. All right. Now moving on to one-time costs, public safety, looking to my colleagues for determination. I'd like to make a motion that um, this item is in consistent with the priorities of the measure and should be forwarded to the city council in regards to its approval. Right. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by committee member Prince and a second by committee member Perez Andreessen. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz. Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy. No. Committee member Madeline. 
No. Committee member Dewey is absent. Committee member present Dreesen. Aye. Committee member Keller is also absent. Committee member Komen. Aye. Committee member Singh. Aye. And committee member Prince. Yes. Motion is approved with Vice Chair Abernathy and committee member Madland voting no. And committee member Committee members Dewey and Keller absent. Before we move to the next item, I will just return to my colleagues and ask if anyone who had a no vote would like anything included in the record. Well, my, vote's a, my vote's a concern on the amount of money on some of these and <clears throat> the, the fact that some of these estimates uh, are high, which concerns me about the rest of it. All right. My concern is, is spending money when we're not hitting the top items um, that face us currently. And money could be used and then address some of these issues the following year. Thank you. Now on to homelessness, one-time requests. Again, this supports our homeless court effort, district attorney's office and others to help divert homeless individuals into the right kind of programs. And then the one roofing project that was not included as part of our expansion. Got it. All right, turning to my colleagues for determination. That's what we just voted on. No, that's the that's roundup. Um, that's just something. Um, that's what I thought also. I thought we were voting on that. That's a summary. Yes. So what's just to... I feel a lot less about I feel a lot more than I thought. I feel like they're... Yeah. I'm doing my vote either way. Good, good, good. So yes, I would just say what's on your screen is, um, I know as we're, yeah, we're, yeah. No, no, the screen was correct when we voted. So um, if we could, if we could advance to the. Sorry, yeah, I moved back in case there were questions on the last one. We're on this one now. Yes. I'd like to make a motion for adoption in, in regards to um, the item regarding the PBS request addressing homelessness. Um, that this item is consistent with the priorities of the measure and should be uh, forwarded to the city council for approval. Awesome. So I've got a motion by committee member Prince and a second by Vice Chair Abernathy. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Chair Ortiz. Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy. Aye. <clears throat> committee member Madeline. Aye. Committee member Dewey's absent. Committee member Present Treason. Aye. Committee member Keller is also absent. Committee member Komen. Aye. Committee member Singh. Aye. Committee member Prince. Yes. Motion is approved with committee members Dewey and Keller absent. Moving on to one time requests on fiscal solvency. Yeah, now on the screen uh, are uh, a small uh, bucket of items. The most notable is the market compensation set aside. The others are uh, what I have called in previous years low cost but high return on investment programs that help with um, our city efficiencies around auditing, um, performance, customer service, engagement, and, and the like. All right. I'll make the motion. Thank you. We have a motion by committee member Perez Andreessen. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, you have a motion by committee member Perez Andreessen and a second by committee member Prince. Uh, this is consistent with the, um, the measure and um, recommend council approval. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz. Aye. Committee member, oh, apologize, Vice Chair Abernathy. Aye. Committee member Madeline. No. Committee member Dewey is absent. Committee member uh, Perez Andreessen? Aye. Committee member Keller is absent. Committee member Komen? Aye. 
Committee Member Singh? Aye. Committee Member Prince? No. Motion is approved with committee members Madland and Prince voting no and committee members Dewey and Keller absent. All right. I'm going to return to my colleagues. Uh, committee Member Prince? Yes, if I may, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in regards to the grant writing contract assistance, uh, I do think that should be internal in the staff um, personally. And then also uh, the COLA, the market compensation adjustment set aside. I also think that should be a part of the general budget and not part of this measure. <laughs> <laughs> Committee Member Madeline, any comments? <laughs> I would just say I did vote yes, but I would like it noted. I mean, I would like a report back on model of excellence program. I mean, I know we've talked about, you know, that this is, you know, an internal, you know, audit-esque function, but I, I think this was something that was conceptual, and I think we'd all like, you know, details on how that's being implemented and how that's actually getting some cost savings, hopefully, to the city. City Council goal number four related to um, quality of life. It's principally parks. And uh, they're the last two items, or excuse me, the, the last three items mm -hmm. are not. One is that related to our spay neuter program. The other is the public art program. And then lastly, it's related to our graffiti removal operations. The rest are all park investments. Mm -hmm. All right, turn to my colleagues for a determination here. I'd like to make a motion for approval. This item is consistent with the priorities of the measure and uh, should be forwarded to the City Council for approval. All right, there's a motion. Is there a second? second? Committee Member Singh, we have a motion from uh, Committee Member Prince and a second from Committee Member Singh. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz? Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy? No. Committee Member Madeline? Committee Member Dewey is absent. Committee Member Perez Andreessen? Aye. Committee Member Keller is absent. Committee Member Komen? Aye. Committee Member Singh? Aye. Committee Member Prince? Yes. Okay. Motion is approved with Vice Chair Abernathy and Committee Member Madland voting no, and Committee Members Dewey and Keller absent. Right. I'll return to my colleagues. Anything for the record, <coughs> Vice Chair? I believe the goal of Measure N was not <clears throat> so much on uh, this park situation. I think we've already spent a lot of money on park rangers and some of these other things. I think it's not what the priority was on that measure. Thank you. Can you remember, Madeline, anything for the record? I would support it if it was probably cut in half, <laughs> but at, this, at that price, no. And I would just like, to, for the record, again, I voted yes on this because I do, I do um, agree with all of the park improvements. I, I am concerned about public art. And again, concept, more guardrails around that and what that actually looks like in terms of a programmatic piece. I also voted yes, but uh, I have the same concerns regarding the uh, public art uh, project. I'd like to see that the, uh, uh, that the council consider some uh, you made a good point, fence around it. What does that mean exactly? I, I think that there is an opportunity there, uh, but I also think there is an opportunity for some abuse, and I, I certainly don't want that to become a, a political hot potato. Uh, I'll just, if I may, just suggest that um, both the model of excellence and the public art program will require council approval before those funds are more specifically programmed. Thank you. All right, we're getting there. Infrastructure. Infrastructure. Uh, this is, uh, again, largely in um, actually streets, but you know, to our prior conversation, um, not, not as much asphalt as, or not entirely asphalt, but um, largely street infrastructure, significantly leveraging grant funds. We've actually never had a grant match fund before. We're really fortunate, I think, this year to be able to put funds aside to leverage more towards um, our grants. 
Um, and then the rest is really uh, road infrastructure of, uh, outside of the bicycle and pedestrian grant match fund. Turn to my colleagues for determination, action. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion in regards to um, the enhanced infrastructure request here that it is, uh, incons it is consistent with priorities of the measure and uh, should be forwarded to the City Council for approval. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. We have a motion from Committee Member Prince and a second from Committee Member Perez Andreessen. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz? Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy? No. Committee Member Madlin? No. Committee Member Dewey is absent. Committee Member Perez Andreessen? Aye. Committee Member Keller is absent. Committee Member Komen? Yes. Committee Member Singh? Aye. Committee Member Prince? Yes. Motion is approved with Vice Chair Abernathy and Committee Member Madlin voting no, and Committee Members Dewey and Keller absent. Anything for the record? Uh, my objection would be that uh, infrastructure to me is roads, construction, I don't see. I see beautification, I don't see asphalt. Okay. Committee member Madland? Actually, the same call, uh, call, comment, you know, money going to roads. Okay. If, if there weren't so much more roads and then throwing some of this stuff in, I totally, absolutely. All right. And, and last one is uh, also infrastructure related, but we put it in the category of council goal number eight because it's very specifically an infrastructure project that is designed to invest in our downtown core and it has elements of quality of life, economic development and um, you know, safety related to it. Um, but this is, it, it is a, a road improvement project, but that is designed, again, to have complete streets, more walkability, and be an economic development, redevelopment incentive tool in this part of downtown. So then they run, they run parallel. Mm -hmm. Is there a... I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, assume the floor. So I don't recall, uh, I don't recall any, I, I'm sorry, I, no, no, I must no. have been. I, I think we all have the same question. I, I don't know if we feel like we've been fully briefed on exactly. this item. Thank I you. think that there was a line item in Mr. I won't even attempt to say his last name. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think it went with much detail. And so Thank I you. think it's probably the resistance you're seeing here. No, yeah. I appreciate, I'm glad folks are letting us know. Um, this, it, it was in the infrastructure um, lineup, but to give a little more specifics. So there's a segment of South H, or not South H, but H Street south of California to Brundage as well as Chester from Truxton to Brundage. Did I say California? I'm sorry. It is H from Truxton to Brundage and Chester from Truxton to Brundage needs repaving. So this will repave those two streets. They're actually, with the completion of the Centennial Corridor, those will actually become our most used north-south routes from Highway 58 into downtown. And so, there's an important economic development aspect. They need to be repaved anyway. We're taking the opportunity though, not just to repave them, but to include bike lanes, include a nicer median, include sidewalks that are more walkable, and it will be an economic development tool for the businesses on either side of both streets into downtown. But very importantly, it's our key through fares from the 58 into downtown. Thank you. That's a lot more clear. And as somebody who uh, plans to take the Westside Parkway to H to get to their office um, once uh, the Centennial Corridor is completed, 
This is something that I would definitely support. So look to my colleagues for action. I'll make the motion. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll make it second. Thank you. So we got a motion from committee member Perez Andreessen, a second from committee member Singh. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chair Ortiz. Aye. Vice Chair Abernathy. Aye. Committee member Madland. Aye. Committee member Dewey is absent. Committee member Perez Andreessen. Aye. Committee member Keller is absent. Committee member Komen. Aye. Committee member Singh. Aye. Committee member Prince. I have an office on 8th Street, so I will abstain. Motion is approved with committee member Prince abstaining and committee, member, committee members Dewey and Keller absent. Okay, with that, Madam Clerk, next item, please. Committee comments. I'm sure we all feel that we've said it all, but I will return to my colleagues in just a moment. But I would just say, if you'll allow me just this, this point of, of pleasure for, for the chair, uh, again, I just would say we were all appointed for our individual perspectives. I think we brought them through this budget cycle. We asked tough questions. We drilled down. Um, really proud of the work that we did here. And thank you, everybody, for participating in this. And with that, I will turn to my colleagues if you have any other comments. I think Committee Member Prince and then Committee Member Komen. Mr. Chair, real quick, in regards to the um, question that um, uh, com committee member Coleman asked earlier in regards to responses, and I think we went down the line to offer responses, I would ask that all of those responses actually be turned over to the city council as well. I think there was some good information in there in regards to uh, some of our concerns. Yeah. For, for a point of clarification, committee member, you mean on the general discussion? Correct. Correct. Yeah, we'll do that. That's a great, great suggestion. Thanks. Right. Committee Member Coleman. Well, uh, I think uh, Commissioner Prince probably hit it because uh, I, I was going to ask for some motion or some discussion uh, in terms of a recommendation to the council on what that restriction should be for recurring costs. So I, I guess if we just leave it at, and a lot, you say that they're already addressing it, so maybe it's moot. My, my one caution I'll defer to council is that it, it's a, probably a significant enough topic for today that um, we, it wouldn't be appropriate to take action on it as it wasn't agendized on this meeting. Um, I, I do, I would, uh, um, for just an example, Vice Chair Weir made a very specific referral for this topic to be addressed. I, so I think it is fair to say it will be addressed. But what we can commit to as staff is communicating to this group when that will be taken up and when it's been determined by the council and that way there's an opportunity to provide input. I think too, um, one of the reasons that I recommended that, that uh, appointments to this committee be made um, by um, each of the elected officials is it gives an opportunity for you to you know, have a, uh, an audience with your appointing council members so you can provide your feedback in a valuable way to them as they lean into that policy discussion. My last comment is that uh, I just want to reiterate uh, Commissioner Ortiz's comment. I, I think that this commission uh, represents uh, the cross section of diversity for the for uh, the city, and so it's always interesting to me how uh, we can generally reach consensus, even though we have different perspectives of things. And I, I think this was a very uh, good exercise. So, uh, and thank you, Commissioner Ortiz, for. Uh, uh, keeping control of it. <laughs> thank you. Any other comments? I will just thank our staff and especially those who stuck around to the bitter end. Thank you very much. And we are adjourned at 334.